All right, started recording. So just be warned, this is this is being recorded. However, that doesn't mean that you will appear in the recording only if only if you speak. I think, no, I think I know that you will you will be in the recording. So uh, so just just to warn you about that. So welcome those select few of the 94 registered <laughs> to this event of the Institute for uh, Mathematics and Democracy. And for those of you who know what this is, it's an initiative, an effort that Professor Stanley Chang and I started. I'm Ismar Volich, professor at the Wellesley's Math Department. And Professor Chang and I have, have you know, started this initiative. Basically, the, the idea is to to do as much as possible uh, with education, research, and outreach in fields that live in the intersection of math and politics. And rather than, than, than talk more about that, let me actually just copy, uh, copy the link to our website and to chat. And also let me copy the link of our Twitter page, Twitter, some what's it called page account in there. So go and like do whatever you do on Twitter. Follow us, like us. I don't know, but whatever happens on Twitter. So uh, and most importantly, if you want to get involved with the stuff that the Institute does, uh, contact us, let us know, reach out to us. So one of the things that that's Professor Ching and I started this year is this fellows program where uh, it's a it's a year long program mostly for juniors although one of our fellows this year is a senior and and the idea is that this cohort of students would would stay together for the year and sort of learn about math and politics attend sort of uh, reading uh, reading groups and we'd have discussions with them and then eventually they would branch off into their own or sort of subgroup kind of research projects or, or sort of independent study projects, possibly leading into a re research even in the summer and, and maybe even during their senior, senior year. So this is our sort of inaugural class of, of fellows who are going to be giving these presentations today. And at the end, Professor Chang will give, a, give the, the, final, the final presentation. The idea is to sort of stop thinking about the elections for a few hours by talking about the elections somehow. <laughs> and, and the theme is really the math behind the, the path of the ballot, right? As you cast your ballot uh, today or, or, you know, or, or, or before today, uh, what happens to it up until the moment that the president is elected, right? What's the math behind the democratic processes of this ballot becoming, you know, helping uh, uh, elect the, the president of the United States. So that's, re that's really the, the, the basic theme. And it, it, as you start thinking about it, you realize, well, you're really talking about voting method. You're talking about our electoral college. You're talking about apportionment process for our House of Representatives. And you're talking about, you know, gerrymandering so the sort of four basic pieces that go into into our presidential elections so that's where our four our four fellows will be talking about so a little bit of housekeeping uh so this is all being recorded during the presentation so there'll be short presentations by by the four students followed by some discussions and you can during the talks if you have questions or comments put them in the chat either to everyone or to me, and then during the discussion, I'll try to moderate uh, the discussion with those questions. And you know, if there's if if there remains only a, a, a few of us, we can even sort of just sort of speak. And you know, if you really if you really need to know something during the presentation, have a question, raise your virtual hand. My daughter turned some of the phone back there. Uh, maybe raise your hand on Zoom, and I'll call on you or 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 just leave stuff in the chat. So, so we'll sort of play by ear depending on how many people we have. So that's, let me just see, I have some notes here. Yeah, I think that's about it as far as sort of house, housekeeping goes. And, and, you know, let's just start. So our students are Minerva Johar, she's a, she's a junior. Eliza Ziska, also a junior. Rebecca Yi, junior. And Shreya Parjan, who is, a, who is a senior. And that's the order in which they will give their presentation. So, so uh, 
I guess we'll just start without further further uh, delays, right? So Minerva Johar is first. She's like I said, she's a junior. She's a, a math and physics major, and you know one of our fellows this year. So go ahead. Okay, um, let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about different voting methods. So that's both what voters put on their ballots, like who you vote for versus how many people you vote for, things like that. And also how those votes are tallied to come up with a winner for the election. So I'm gonna start by talking about probably the simplest way to do it, which is a majority vote. And in a majority voting system, a candidate that gets above 50% of the vote is the winner. So we can see there are two examples here. The one on the left, we have two candidates, A and B. A has 55% of the vote and B has 45%, so A wins. And in the one on the right, there are three candidates. A has 51%, B has 40%, and C has 9% of the vote. A still wins with 51% of the vote because that's greater than 50%. But we can see how very easily if C or B had gotten a little bit more of the vote, maybe no one would have had over 50%. And then in a majority system, there is no winner. So this is a problem in elections with three or more candidates, which is a significant portion of elections. So the way that most elections in the US deal with this is through a system called plurality vote, which is just whoever has the highest percentage of the vote is the winner. So in this example, we have five candidates, which is quite a lot. A has 26% of the vote, B has 24%, C has 23%, D has 13%, and E has 14%. So A is the plurality winner with 26% of the vote, but this seems kind of wrong because even though A is the winner, they didn't really get that many votes. And we have no way of knowing maybe most people who voted for D or E would have preferred B over A, in which case this seems like an unfair result. It's, it doesn't really give us enough information to figure out the preferences of the voters in an accurate way. So one example where this phenomenon called vote splitting happened is in the 2016 Republican presidential primary. So Trump was the winner, as we know, and he won with 44.9% of the popular vote. But the other candidates, the more moderate candidates, all split the vote amongst themselves. Trump was the fringe candidate and he benefited from not really having another candidate that was very similar to him. But all the moderate candidates split the more moderate voters among themselves. And polls even indicate that voters preferred either Rubio or Cruz over Trump in one-on-one -on -one contests. But because there were all of these other candidates, Trump ended up winning a plurality of the vote, even though maybe a majority of voters did not want Trump to win the primary. Then we have another example of this, which is the 2010 election for governor in Maine, where again, a fringe candidate, Paul LePage, won the election with 38.2% of the votes. So this is even less than Trump won with um, because there are two candidates, Elliot Cutler and Libby Mitchell. Elliot Cutler was an independent candidate and Libby Mitchell was a Democrat who split the more moderate and liberal vote among themselves. Even though polls showed that the people who voted for either of them would have preferred the other candidate over Paul LePage. So these are some examples that show why plurality voting doesn't always give us the result that it seems, that seems most natural based on the preferences of the voters. So how do we fix that? There needs to be some system that gives more information on what the voters want. And the ones that we're gonna talk about today are all examples of ranked choice voting. So in ranked choice voting, voters rank candidates in order of preference. So we have a chart here that shows an example of a, rank, a set of ranked choice ballots. It might be a little bit hard to interpret, but what it means is the, le the left column means that 20 voters had a ballot where they ranked A over B, B over D, and D over C. Then 18 voters had a ballot where they ranked D over B, B over C, and C over A. 10 voters ranked B over C, C over D, and D over A. And two voters ranked A over C, C over D, and D over B. So the voters rank the candidates in order of their preference. And now we have to figure out how to determine a winner. So using the plurality system, A has the most first place votes with 22. So A is the plurality winner. 
So there are 50 voters in total here. So any candidate would need 25, more than 25 first place votes to be a majority winner. There is no majority winner here since A has the highest at 22. There are other, so plurality voting says A wins, but the goal of this was to move away from plurality voting. So other ways to decide the winner would be instant runoff or board account, which are two methods that I'm going to talk about now. And there are also a multitude of other methods that can be used to figure out who should win this election. So with instant runoff, the way it works is taking the candidate with the fewest first place votes and eliminating them from this chart here and repeating the process until we have a majority winner. So in the chart here, which is the same one from the previous slide, C has zero first place votes, which is the lowest. So we remove C from all the ballots and just leave everyone else alone. So that's what gets us from the chart on the far left to the middle chart with just A, B, and D. And now we look at the second chart and see who has the first place votes now. So A has 22, D has 18, and B has 10. So B has the fewest and we want to eliminate B, which gets us to the chart on the far right. Now A has 22 votes and D has 28. 28 is above 25, which remember is the cutoff for having a majority winner. So D is the winner of the instant runoff. And this is different from the plurality winner. But one thing to notice is that if you look at the original chart or the final one on the right, we can see that 28 people, a majority of people, ranked D above A. But the plurality winner was A anyway. That doesn't really seem like a fair result. And the instant runoff solves that problem by having this recursive system until we get to a final winner with a majority of votes. OK, so another way that we can tally ranked choice votes is using something called a board account. So in this system, instead of eliminating candidates with the fewest first place votes, we assign a certain number of points to each vote for a candidate. So in an election with n candidates, first place, each first place vote for a candidate is worth n minus one points. Second is worth n minus two points and you would keep subtracting one point each time. So in this example, we have four candidates. So first place is worth three points, second is worth two, third is worth one and last place is worth zero. So if we tally the points, A's score, they have 20 people in the first, in the first column, 20 people ranked A first. So we multiply 20 votes times three, which is the point value assigned to a first place vote. Then in the second and third columns, 18 people ranked A last and 10 people also ranked A last. So 18, 10, zero and 10, 10, zero. And the last column, two people ranked A first. So we do two times three again for a total score of 66. And then if we repeat the process with B, we have 20 second place votes, so that's 20 times two, 18 second place votes, or 18 times two, 10 first place votes, 10 times three, and two last place votes, two times zero for a total score of 106. And we can do similar things with C and D to show that their scores are 42 and 86 respectively. So with 106 points, B has the highest score. So B is the Borda count winner. So all of those were using the same example, and in this example, there was no majority winner. A was the plurality winner, D won the instant runoff, and B was the board account winner. So this raises the question of who the real winner should be. Which system should we use if they all produce different results? So what makes a good voting system? How can we decide which system we should use to decide the winner? One thing that is pretty important in any kind of republic or democracy is this principle of majority rule, which is that we want, like the in the first slide, we talked about a majority rule, which seems fair and is very clear cut when you have two candidates, the person who gets the majority of the vote wins the election. The problem with that is that when you have three or more candidates, it's very hard to extract a clear preference like that. But what we can consider is how these different voting systems deal with this issue. So plurality voting at first glance seems like it should be the closest to majority rule, but it doesn't provide enough information. And as we saw in the previous example, even though a majority of voters preferred D over A, A still won the plurality vote, which doesn't seem like a good result. The board account doesn't take majority rule into account at all. 
because it just assigns point values to each candidate. And there are other methods that can be used that don't even use the same scaling that we went through here in the board account itself, where we had n, n minus one, and so on. So it's really just a sort of weighted score for each candidate. But instant runoff is really built off of the idea of producing a majority winner by eliminating each candidate until we get to someone who has a majority of votes. So instant runoff sort of intuitively seems like it's the closest to this majority rule system, which is why it's the most used ranked choice voting system currently. Okay, so as a little bonus, we're gonna talk about some more properties that a good voting system might have. So some properties that we might want are the Pareto criterion, which is that if everyone prefers candidate A to candidate B, candidate B can't win. And this seems reasonable, right? If everyone likes A over B, why should B win the election? And then there is the independence of irrelevant alternatives or IIA, which is that if the group prefers A to B and some voters change their ballots by moving around other candidates but leaving A and B alone, it shouldn't change the relative ranking of A and B, which also makes sense. We don't want the rankings of any pair of candidates to be affected by moving completely irrelevant candidates around. And the arrow impossibility theorem says that any ranked choice voting system that satisfies both of these criteria is a dictatorship. And that seems bad because we don't want a dictatorship. Even a dictatorship in this case just means that there's one voter whose ballot decides the election. But what this means though, is just that any ranked choice voting system isn't perfect. It doesn't mean that they're bad or shouldn't be used, just that they can't satisfy both of these properties at once. So both of the systems that we looked at, the instant runoff and the board account satisfy the Pareto criterion, but not the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion, which leaves them susceptible to strategic voting since by changing around the rankings of irrelevant candidates, you can, a, a smart voter could influence the outcome of a ranking between two completely different candidates. But that doesn't necessarily mean that ranked choice voting shouldn't be used because ranked choice voting still has numerous advantages over our current system of plurality voting. It captures more information about preferences and gives more freedom to voters in that it allows them to vote according to their heart and their own true preferences instead of trying to worry about whether they're voting for a candidate that has a chance of winning the election or not, which is what a plurality system sort of forces people into. Okay, so some final takeaways from this is that plurality voting, our current system, is easy to understand but doesn't really represent group preferences very well. Ranked choice voting, in addition to offering more freedom to us, better reflects group preferences and change is on the way. Ranked choice voting is currently on the ballot in Massachusetts and Alaska, which is the yes on two you see on the right, question two in Massachusetts. So we can look out for the results of that. And it's already used in Maine as well as several cities across the country. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you. That was great. Uh, so let's see, any questions, comments, concerns about how you, maybe you went out today and voted no on two? <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> Minerva, can you can I ask a question? Can you say a little bit about you mentioned vote splitting before for plurality? Is that an issue with with the instant runoff? That is. Let me see. Can I go? Oops. If I go back to instant runoff, that's not an issue for instant runoff because let's say you you really let's say you're one of these ten voters here and you don't think B has a chance of winning the election, but you really like B. You can still vote for B at the top because once the instant runoff is tabulated, as long as you've ranked your or ranked everyone correctly, it sh the final result should still reflect your preferences. So um, 
I guess to use a real world example, probably the most famous example of vote splitting would be the 2000 presidential election. So maybe if people who'd voted for Ralph Nader had voted for Al Gore instead, the outcome might have been different. But with ranked choice voting, they could put Nader first and Gore second and Bush third. And if Nader had the fewest first place votes, which he would have, he would have been eliminated and then their votes would have gone to Gore instead. So that's how it gives the voter more freedom in who they can vote for. And I guess it, it should also be said that it that it encourages participation by underrepresented groups uh, because of the often candidates uh, from underrepresented groups are are sort of reluctant to to compete uh, in, fe in fear in fear that they will. I didn't get that. Could you try again? I don't know we're having okay iPad. I was getting some feedback. Maybe from Alex. Alex says, Alex, I will mute you. Sorry. Uh, uh, in fear that they might take away, in fear that they might be the Ralph Nader for, for a candidate. Right. But with ranked choice, that's not an issue. Anybody can, can run. And, you know, if they get some votes, they get them. And if they're eliminated, their vote, the votes are passed down to the next candidate. And it's not, a, it's not an issue. Right. So yes, we like we like instant runoff. Any other? I have a few questions in the chat. So Professor Ching asked, I guess it didn't have to be in privately to me because not everybody's gonna know. Does ranked choice ignore people who show up in second place on a particular ballot? On, wait, I'm not sure. You mean like in one particular? Yeah, I guess it does because if the candidate you rank first is like in this example, if you put A or D first, then your second choice didn't matter in the end. So there must be a way, there must be, there, there probably are ways where you, I mean, you have to decide whom to eliminate each time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the, this instant runoff is, is designed to eliminate people who didn't come in first, right? Mm -hmm. But you can imagine like a weighted version <laughs> of instant runoff where the, the eliminated person at every step is determined in some other kind of way. Right, right. so I was, I was thinking about this earlier today, how like, the board account actually doesn't have the same thing the instant runoff does where it favors first place votes over everything else. Like it, it has other problems, but it by doing this weighted score system, it doesn't privilege first place votes over everything else. So those are worth more points. So like if you voted A or D first, your second place vote for B still counts. And that's actually why B wins in this example. But right, B B wins because oh, why does B win? Uh, because they have B has like all these second place votes. Right, B has more first and second place votes than anybody else. Mm -hmm. But in the instant runoff, those second place votes didn't really mean anything for B. Right. I mean, you can imagine a situation where you, instead of counting the number of times they appear on the first row, you you count the number of times they appear in the first k rows, right, and then eliminate according to that, right. Um, right. So, so you can do really, you can do really well in second place, but just barely not have enough first place votes, and then you get eliminated. You could have like been in this in the second row all across, right? Right. But maybe it just didn't. You know, you got eked. Somebody else eked out a, a first place win over you, yeah. and then you're gone, right? So that does seem a little bit, you know, strange. Right, but um, board, board account would take it into account. The reason why A didn't win the board account, right, is like because of those two bottom slots that it's in, right? Those zero, zero earned points really cost A. Wow. Right. I mean, this is sort of like a, I mean, 
you know, when you have a dictatorship, one, one person decides, right? One person, there's like the weight is all on one person. And this ranked choice method of elimination is sort of like a, like a dictatorship in that there's only one row that decides, right? Who stays and who leaves, right? Right, I think it's like a question of like mm, what we want to value more because the instant runoff really value, it's, it values first place. I mean, more, less, less than like plurality voting does where that's the only thing that even matters, but it's, it's heavily weighted towards that kind of system. Even if someone like really doesn't care that much between their first or second place candidates, the one that gets ranked first is still gonna have the advantage. So, so the processes that are on the table in Alaska and Massachusetts and are already in place in Maine, does that follow the first call, first row process? I believe so. I don't know about Maine, but I know, well, the, the version that's being implemented in New York in 2021 is using this instant runoff method. Yes, they're all, they're all the same instant runoff. So they're all just biased the first line. Right. That's right. right. Can you, Mira, can you tell us something about if just if you remember, I know this is not this is off script, right? But but there are voting methods that are not ranked choice, right. right? Approval voting being sort of the main representative of those cardinal voting methods. Do you remember what it is and what it, what it does? So like approval voting would be you have a list of candidates and each voter can check off who they're like, okay with this person can be president or whatever, and then leave the ones that they don't approve of blank. Or you could have a system where each voter gets like a certain number of points or things that they can assign to each candidate. Like you can give five to Gore and five to Nader and zero to Bush, or you can give them like four, three and three or whatever. Right, the, the, the first one is what I was thinking, or you just check the names of all the candidates you're okay with. Right, you, that you don't mind they win, right? Yeah. I would say like the, there, I mean, obviously there's like pros and cons to all of them. The con of that one is that it doesn't really reflect how much you're okay with them. Maybe you really love one, but the other one you're just like, fine, whatever, yeah. Right, so it's not very expressive, right? You're just saying yes or no, but you're not, you, you don't have a chance of saying how much yes and how much no, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what the ranked ranked system does, does for you. Uh, but I do want to. I, I want to say something that the, the reason I brought up the the approval voting is that. So, there are several major sort of math societies in the U.S. American Mathematical Society, Mathematical Association of America, Society for Industrial Applied Mathematics, Association for Women in Mathematics. Right, all these big ones. They all use approval voting. In their in when they when we choose officers for you know committees and things. we all use approval voting. So the fact that math societies are, are using this other kind of voting sort of get, always gives me pause. The advantage is that those cardinal methods like approval voting they are not susceptible to error and possibility theorems. So to mathematicians who care about things like you know these abstract theorems, uh, we we prefer approval voting. But that's like you know it's but but rank choice is winning so that's we should we should su support it i guess <laughs> yeah what else do we have as far as questions comments so you people just feel free to speak up or 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 uh, put stuff in the so here's a here's a question that's a good question what is the pushback against ranked choice voting? So what's the argument against it for, you know, if it's on the ballot? So most of what I've seen is that it's just too complicated or too hard to understand. And voters understand, oh, just check off who you want to vote for, but they don't want to like spend all the effort ranking all the candidates. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that I disagree with that assessment. Um, because I mean, it is, it requires more work a little bit more work on the part of the voter but it also lets you have a lot more say in and a lot more freedom in how we vote which is what we were talking about earlier where you can really vote for who you think is best instead of trying to think about who has a chance to win and 
so those are the advantages. And then I guess the other thing is that like the major parties don't really like ranked choice voting because it would it would harm them, which is why they advocate against it. But um, I think mathematically and logically speaking, it, it works better than what we currently do. Here's a here's a complication that I was I just thought of. So, so suppose you have 10 candidates, okay, and they're running for something. And as the voter, you know, you know only a few of them, and you know that you hate uh, A, but you love B and C, right? But you don't know anything about the people in the middle, right? So uh, what I would do is I would just rank, you know, B, C, and then A, because A is the worst person that I know about and leave everything else blank. For example, right? But that might be interpreted in, in a different way. That might say, oh, I prefer uh, I prefer C or A, whom I don't like, to all the people that I did not actually vote for, right? Well, does, that, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think in that case, well, there's like sort of two ways you can implement this. One in which you require everyone to rank all the candidates where a voter who doesn't know the rest of them would just either have to like place them randomly or ideally they would do some research and figure out where to put them. Um, or if you don't require everyone to, to rank all the candidates, then I guess like the correct way to do it would be to just not rank A and only rank the candidates that you actually like. So what happens in practice is you are not required to rank all the all the candidates precisely because of this. So what you would do is you would rank B and C and then you would not, that, that would end your ranking, right? So your ballot would count in the first two rounds of instant runoff, but then it would be discarded after that should the instant runoff continue past that second round. So there's no way for you to express, I really, really, really don't want A to win this election <laughs> unless I rank everybody, right? But uh, I, even if you rank everybody, yeah. It's, it's actually, yeah, it's actually the same you putting. Yeah, right. It doesn't, it doesn't really affect anything because if A was going to win, regardless of your ballot, whether you rank them last or don't rank them, wouldn't affect it. Right. It actually doesn't matter. So this is how uh, Insta Roundup actually prevents strategic oh, I, voting. Right, so it's, right, right. It's good in that sense. So you just wouldn't, you would, so you just, so for example, in, in the town of the city of Cambridge, they've been using ranked choice voting for, for a long time, right? And a few years ago, they had something like 25 candidates for like a school council or, or something, right? I mean, there's, there's no way you're gonna know 25 candidates and have strong enough opinion on 25 of them to be able to actually rank them, right? So you rank a few and you leave the, leave the rest unfilled and that's, that's fine, that, that works too. Right, because rank choice bias is the first one. So if it's not first, right. then it doesn't really kind right. of matter what comes after that. Right. right. Another objection to to rank, yeah. So it, uh, you read Minerva that the the biggest objection is, you know, people are stupid. They don't understand how this works, which is uh, horrible, right? Uh, but the second objection is, oh, it's like it's like voting twice. Nobody should be able to vote twice or three times or four times, right? Because you're giving, you're ranking the candidates. You're if you're if if you rank for the candidate who gets thrown out, your second candidate is bumped to the top. Suddenly your vote counts sort of again for this your second candidate or third or fourth. So the, the an incorrect interpretation of the system is that it's allowing you to vote more than once, which shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, but of course in reality it's not voting more than once because your vote. Like the actual final tally happens only when, once you get down to the person who has a majority of votes. And that's when your vote counts. It's not right. the ones that go, get thrown out aren't really votes. They're just right. yeah. Exactly right. And it's and the procedure is such that you do only one thing once, namely rank all the candidates. It's not like something happened and then you were asked to come back again into the voting booth and do something again. And then like something happened and you're like, oh, let me, let me think about it now. And then you... It's not. It's not that kind of repeat vote. So yeah. Any other question? Well, let's take let's take a two minute break and then then we'll uh, we'll continue with our 
next dock at, at, at 540. Right. Welcome everyone who wasn't who just joined us. So we'll get started with the next talk. And just for, again, for those of you who just joined, you can, if you have comments or questions, you can put them in the chat. You can direct them to everyone or, or just to me. And uh, this is being recorded, but, but you won't be visible since the Zoom just records the person who's speaking. So, uh, so yeah. All right, Liza, you ready? So the next talk is on the Electoral College. So, so remember, we're, we're, we're tracing your ballot, how, how it helps elect the president of the United States. So we talked about voting. And now, now the, there is this thing called the Electoral College. So Eliza is, is another one of our fellows of the Institute for Math and Democracy. And she's also a junior. And she's a math and geosciences uh, major. So, uh, so go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. So let me just get started here. As Professor Volich mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the Electoral College a little bit and some of its key flaws, specifically through the lens of math, since we are the Institute for Mathematics and Democracy. So to begin, what exactly is the Electoral College? It's the system with which we elect the next president of the United States, and it's actually made up of a group of electors. So these are individuals elected by the voters in each state who then get together after the actual election to officially choose the next president. Practically, however, when we talk about the Electoral College, we treat these electors as electoral votes, since nowadays when voting for electors, citizens of a state or the District of Columbia are choosing who their election electors are going to cast their vote for. So in this way, the electors are kind of middlemen between the voters of a state and the state's electoral votes. The specific number of electoral votes for each state are based loosely on a state's population. And we're gonna talk more about this and the issues that this loosely leads to. And you can see in the map on the screen that it under each state's name, it has the number of electoral votes that it's awarded. Um, and then the Constitution 
uh, says that states are allowed to decide their method of choosing electors. And so today the popular vote is used in all 50 states to do so. And in 48 states, the plurality winner, which is something that Minerva was bringing up, plurality versus majority, um, and where plur plurality is the candidate with the most votes, gets all of the electoral votes for that state. And Nebraska and Maine actually have a slightly dis different system in which they divide their electoral votes based on uh, what percentage of the popular vote the candidates get. So the Electoral College is a winner-take-all weighted voting system. And to break that down, uh, it means that not every voter, which is in this case the different states, gets the same amount of votes. And that's what makes it weighted. And then it also means that whoever wins the most votes wins the whole thing. So there's no way to really break up the presidency uh, depending on what percentage of the electoral votes you get. And so in this way, whoever gets the majority uh, wins the presidency. And since there are 538 electoral votes in total, the simple majority, which is just over 50%, is 270. And if uh, no candidate gets over 50% or if there's a tie, then the decision is sent to the House of Representatives where each state is given one vote. This map just kind of shows how the Electoral College can shake out. So you can see four years ago, probably still fresh on many of our minds. Um, this is an example of an electoral map. And the way it's coded is that each state is the color of the candidate who won all of those votes. So all of the red states, their electoral votes went to Donald Trump and all of the blue states, their votes went to Hillary Clinton. And you can see that Maine here is striped and that's because three of its electoral votes actually went to Hillary Clinton and one went to Donald Trump. And you can see at the top that uh, Trump received 306 electoral votes in total, which is way over the 270 needed to win. And so therefore he became the president. So how did this system come to be? The Electoral College is actually the result of a lot of debate and compromise on how to choose the next head of state that happened at the 1787 Constitutional Convention. The national popular vote was actually one of the methods proposed for choosing the next president but the main objection came from Southern slaveholding states. And this was because a large percentage of these states' populations was made up of enslaved people who were deprived of their right to freedom and obviously then also their right to vote. And so therefore, if we were looking at the population of eligible voters, these Southern states had a much, much lower percentage of the eligible voter population. And therefore in any election, they would always lose to a Northern candidate. And so they were very against using the national popular vote. Additionally, uh, Southern states wanted to preserve the advantage given to them by the three-fifths compromise. And essentially, this is another part of the Constitution, which said that enslaved people counted for only three-fifths of a person when calculating, when calculating state population for representation and federal money. And so in this sense, these Southern states um, the voters in these states were getting extra population representation and extra power by keeping people in slavery, and they didn't want to give that up. So the compromise that was arrived at in order to appease these southern states and to protect the institution of slavery was what we now know today as the Electoral College. Just as today, states could decide how electors were chosen, but at this time, most electors were nominated by the state legislators. And then the original system had a focus on trying to prevent home state biases and also factioning. And so the way it worked was that each elector would cast two votes for president. And then the two, the two votes had to be for different candidates who were from two different states. So if you were from Massachusetts, you couldn't cast two votes for two people from Massachusetts. And then once all of these election electoral votes were tabulated, the first place would become president second place would, get, would become vice president. And the same as today, if there was no majority, it would go to the house. Um, and this system has, take, gives a clear advantage to small states, which is something we're gonna talk about at length later. And also these slaveholding states, since they were getting extra representation for keeping people in slavery. While, and an interesting note that relates to this is if we look at the first 12 presidents, of our country, actually seven of them for, were from Virginia. And a big part of this is because under this system, Virginia got so much extra representation because it was a state that had a huge enslaved population. And so that's kind of why Virginia was so overrepresented in especially the early days of our country. 
So while this system was pretty successful in electing George Washington for the first two elections, it failed in 1796 and 1800. And this was because of the introduction of political parties. So in both of these elections, the parties who were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans at the time um, tried to game the system by having their party vote for their president and vice presidential candidate as each of their two votes. And then they would have a few electors not vote for the vice presidential candidate so that their presidential candidate got the most first place votes and therefore became president. In 1800, actually, however, because of a miscommunication, uh, this resulted in a tie between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, who were both Democratic Republicans. And if you've actually ever seen the musical Hamilton, you know the role that Alexander Hamilton played in convincing the House to choose Jefferson, and that's how he became the next president. So after this fiasco, Congress saw that the system needed to be changed. The Federalists then, then again pushed for uh, the popular vote since they were mostly in the North and it benefited Northern states. But because you need so much support for an amendment, they weren't able to achieve this. And the Democratic Republicans in 1803 pushed through a new system, which is now the 12th Amendment. In this system, separate votes were cast for president and vice president. And the main motivation behind this was to kind of uh, foster this idea of majority rule so that there was no ability for the minority parties to have an influence on the majority uh, desire. And which was something that was more possible under the old system since if the minority party didn't like one of the candidates that the majority party had up, they could just uh, put half of their votes up for the other majority party candidate who would then win. So it was kind of this fail safe to protect the minority party desires, but the 12th amendment got rid of this. So briefly just wanna to touch on why, where does this number 538 come from? The constitution says that each state gets the number of electoral votes equal to the number of representatives it has in the house and then the number of senators it has. So that gives us 435 representatives for the House plus 100 senators. And then by the 23rd Amendment, the District of Columbia gets the minimum number of electoral votes, so three. And that gives us 538 with a simple majority of 270. So we've already seen some of the problematic origins of the Electoral College, but now we're gonna take a look at its issues through a mathematical lens. The first one, which is probably all too familiar to many of us, is the discrepancy between the Electoral College results and the national popular vote. In 2016, Donald Trump won the Electoral College and presidency, even though Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by almost 3 million votes. And this has actually happened four other times in the history of our country. Comparing the Electoral College uh, vote to overall country popular vote gets at one of the central changes of our country over the last 200 years. And this is because when the 12th Amendment was created, the country was much more seen as these several separate states who were loosely united under this federal government with the president presiding. Nowadays, however, the federal government is so much stronger and the president has much more of an impact on our daily lives. And so it makes sense to look at this national popular vote number to see what the country as a whole thinks about the president. And so when we look at this number and we see that a majority of the country doesn't favor the person who is running it, that's clearly something that's not democratic and something that should be changed. Another issue of the Electoral College has to do with the fact that it is a plurality system as mentioned earlier. So just as a refresher, that means that in most states, the winner of the electoral votes of that state just has to be the person who got the most percentage, the highest percentage of vote. And this leads to the spoiler effect, which is when third uh, or independent party candidates can determine the result of the election or spoil it for the major party candidates. The most common example of this is in Florida in the 2000 election, um, which ended up determining the whole election, the national election. And it's often said that Bush won because Nader was more popular than Buchanan. So looking at this chart, it kind of illustrates that and that you can see that how Ralph Nader took away more liberal votes from the major party candidate, Al Gore, than uh, Patrick Buchanan took from George Bush. And you can see that George Bush won the state with less than 50% of the vote. So he won the plurality. Um, so even though they got collectively less than 2% of the vote, Ralph Nader and Patrick Buchanan ended up determining the election for the whole country, which goes directly against the principle that the minority party shouldn't have control over what the majority of the country wants. 
The increased popularity of third party candidates in recent elections has also led to a surge in plurality wins. So if you think about this, um, Minerva kind of touched on this, but if you have two candidates to choose from, one necessarily has to get the majority or over 50% or they both tie and they both get 50%. But once you introduce a third or even fourth candidate into the mix, it is possible for a candidate to win individual states and the whole country with way less than 50% of the vote. And a prime example of this is in 1992 when Bill Clinton actually only won the majority in DC and Arkansas. So looking at this chart, you can kind of see why that is, which is that Ross Perot, who is the independent candidate, uh, won almost 20 million popular votes despite not getting any electoral college votes. So he was essentially in each state lowering the percentage that the main party candidate needed to win that state. In 2016, Trump won 101 electoral votes, and so five states this way, and Hillary Clinton actually won 50 electoral votes this way. And, and a study by NPR found that under reasonable assumptions, someone could become president with only 23% of the popular vote, which is clearly another flaw in the system. And interestingly enough, uh, if you think about why this is, you might think that it's by getting uh, some of the really big states and just needing a few of those, but actually the way to win with the fewest percentage is by getting lots of the little states. And we're gonna see why that is. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but at first glance, it, you, you would think that the larger states have more representation in the electoral college since they have more electoral votes, but actually it's the smaller states that benefit more greatly from the system. And this has to do with the, the constitutional requirements. So the constitution says that each state must have at least one representative in the house, which means at least three electoral votes. Um, but if you think about like the states that have the lowest population, what happens if they have a population that's below the population of a congressional district? Then all of the people in that state are way overrepresented. And when you add on, in addition to this, the fact that you're adding two senators to every state, regardless of its population, then you can see that, for example, in Wyoming, adding two senators triples the power because you're going from one vote to three versus in California, which has 53 representatives in the House, adding that two on has a much smaller proportional impact. And if we then look at the ratio of population to electoral votes, we see that a Wyomingites vote actually counts for three much three times as much as a Californian's vote, which clearly violates this important tenet of democracy, which is the principle of one person, one vote. And there are a couple of charts that illustrate this. So the first one, this is a map that shows states with their size proportional to the relative influence of the individual voters who live there. And you can see that the biggest states and district pictured here are actually by no means the biggest practically. They're actually the ones with the least population versus the usually most populous states that we're used to seeing very big like California and Texas and Florida are really tiny in comparison. And this chart kind of illustrates the same thing. So the states here at the bottom are organized by electoral vote with the most with California on the left all the way down to the fewest. And you can see this kind of overall trend that shows that the smaller states have a much lower ratio of the population to the electoral votes uh, than the larger states do which means that they have more voting power per individual voter. Um, and, and then interesting, another interesting note about this chart is that you see this kind of series of bumps and that comes from how we round actually when we're apportioning, which is something that Rebecca is gonna talk more about in her talk. But if you think about as you're increasing the population but keeping the number of electoral votes the same, the ratio of population per electoral vote is gonna go up until you reach that threshold to add on a new electoral vote and then it's gonna go back down. So not only is this there this overall inequality between small states and large states, but also within states of a similar size, there's this inequality. So how do we change the system? How do we fix these issues? The best solution would be to abolish the electoral college altogether. But since that involves changing the constitution, it needs an amendment. So two thirds of Congress and three fourths of states. And this is really hard to achieve. The closest that we got as a country to doing this was in 1969, when a proposed amendment actually passed the House with 82% of approval. But, but it was filibustered by, uh, Dem by Southern Democrats in the Senate because they wanted to protect the power of the white majorities in their states. So they feared that a national popular vote would enfranchise black and underrepresented voters. 
And then today, if we think about could an amendment pass, it's unlikely because there are several groups who favor the Electoral College. We already saw that small states have a huge advantage. And then another group of states is swing states. So this map shows um, the 163 campaign events of the first nine weeks of general campaigning in 2020. And you can see that all of these events were only in 16 states. So these states, which are getting much more attention and money funneled at them, it makes sense that they're not going to want to change the system, that they're going to want to keep the Electoral College in place. And interestingly, when we think about why swing states have so much power, it has to do with the winner take all system. So if you have a state that has um, a, ratio, a closer margin, so like 51 to 49, it makes sense that candidates are going to put in more of their effort to get those few percentage points more so than they are to try to flip like a blue state to be red or vice versa. Um, and so as a result, we have this other inequality between states. And finally, another group that would be more in favor of keeping the Electoral College is the less popular party. We already saw that if you can win with 23, only 23% 23 of the national vote, it makes sense that uh, parties would want to keep the system in place because it's kind of a way for them to, to win even under these extraordinary circumstances. So since an amendment takes so much effort to pass, other solutions involve changing how individual states cast their vote in an effort to make the system more fair. Um, the key to, to fixing issues of plurality winners is this majority rule principle, which states that no candidate receives all of a state's electoral votes unless the candidate gets a majority of the state's popular votes. Now, Minerva talked in her, in her talk just before about some methods that we can change our elections so that we have, so that the winner reflects the preference of the majority more so than what we currently do. And another way is to apportion electoral votes kind of in the same way that Maine and Nebraska do so that the, it, we again get rid of this winner take all system so that if you for example have a state that has 10 electoral votes and one candidate got only 40% of the vote and the other two got 30%, you could divide up the electoral votes by like four, three and three. And a final way is to vote by district. So um, this, and this is a, a way that we do this is a way that we do uh, congressional districts actually. And an issue with this is that it opens it up to gerrymandering, which is something that Shreya is gonna talk about in her talk. Uh, a few final solutions. One of them is the Wyoming rule, which is basically the idea that if we could increase the, the population per congressional district to be equal to the population of the smallest state, which is in this case right now is Wyoming, then we would end up increasing the uh, number of states in the house to be 547 which would give us 650 electoral votes. And this is kind of getting at trying to level out that discrepancy between representation in smaller states and larger states. And another solution is the national popular vote interstate compact. So you can see in this chart to the right, it shows the 15 states plus the District of Columbia who have agreed to give their electoral votes to the candidate who wins the national popular vote, regardless of who wins the plurality in their own states. And if this compact were able to get 270 votes, which it's not at right now, then it would have legal force and the electoral college would essentially be obsolete. So to conclude, I just wanna emphasize that the electoral college was created to protect the system of slavery and today has been shown to determine elections in ways that don't align with our principles of democracy. A common argument in favor of the electoral college is that is the intention of the founders but just because the current system is what the founders put in place, that doesn't make it inherently better because our constitution is meant to be viewed as a living document, which can be changed by the people when we see fit. And so it's our duty to change the system and math can play a huge role in providing evidence for a change. So thank you. Great, Eliza. That's that was really great. Let's open it up to discussion. And uh, and again, you can uh, chime in in the chat or 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 raise your uh, virtual Zoom hand and 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 you know you can just speak with your actual voice <laughs> if you have questions. Uh, let's see, Abby looks like has a hand up. 
Hi, awesome job, Eliza. That was great. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any ideas about how maybe like the electoral college should be taught in school. Um, like I, when I remember learning about the electoral college, I don't remember learning about it as like a bad thing. Um, do you have any advice for like teachers or anyone that would be interested in like education? Like how do you think they should frame this discussion? That's a really interesting question. I think it's, it's interesting because I remember learning about it in school as like, it was kind of this, it was the founders trying to protect their system from the general population. Like there was this fear that if the general population was allowed to vote, but actually when I was doing research for this, I found that that's not the case because if you think of who the voters were at this time, it was the white landowning males, which was the same makeup as the actual congressional delegates. So they didn't really have a fear of that. And so, yeah, it wasn't until researching for this that I found that there's that it was meant to protect slavery. Um, and so I think that kind of in the way, the same way that we talk about the other compromises of the constitution, like the three-fifths compromise and the way that it, uh, it basically baked slavery into the foundings of our country, um, I think it needs to be emphasized in that same way and kind of taught that, that these were the motivations behind it. As a, as a mathemat you know, pure mathematician who likes to think of <laughs> extreme cases, can you explain to us, Eliza, what the minimum number of votes is, is needed to, be, to become president? Sure. You could win how many votes and still be pre become president? So technically, if you have these uh, crazy assumptions, you could actually win presidency with 11 votes um, out of the whole country, of, like 11 people, individual people voting for you. But this is if you assume that basically no one else shows up except for <laughs> 11 individual people in the 11 most populous states. And if they cast their vote for you, then you would get you would you were able to total up the electoral votes to get over this 270 mark. So probably not gonna happen luckily. <laughs> and what's more, you could then say, oh, in the other 39, so one person showed up in each of the 11, top 11 states, right? Assume everybody goes to vote in the other 39 and they all vote for the other person, right? So you still win because you got more electoral, you got 270 electoral votes. But you would win with 0.0000006% of the popular vote. <laughs> President. So this is the kind of crap we love to think about <laughs> with mathematicians. Well, so what happened to the three-fifths rule? What became of that? And did that have much of an effect on future elections? Yeah, another interesting, that's a, a, like when you look at the history is that once the 13th amendment was passed, which gave, uh, which gave citizenship to black Americans, then it got rid of the three fifths compromise because these people were suddenly seen as uh, complete people as they should be uh, since they are actual people. Um, and so this suddenly you have this thing where all of these Southern states actually have more representation because now instead of these populations being seen as three fifths, there are five fifths. And so they're getting even more power, but then instead of actually letting these people vote, now you see this like whole new wave of voter suppression. Um, and so they're still, they're getting even more power for also still having basically the same number of voters since it was often still only the white voters who were voting because they were suppressing all of these black voters. Eliza, I'm Rusty on my government history so I need some support here which is there are some states where like the people who cast the electoral votes they have they base it based on the popular vote but somebody can go against the grain right and decide like oh I just want to vote the way I want to is that correct right there's these things called um elector faith I don't faithless, remember faithless yes. electors thank you yeah. faithless electors and so that's what basically because it's these actual people, which we symbolize with votes, they could actually, when the electoral college gets together, I think it's in December, they could just go against and decide like, oh, my state voted, wanted all of these to go to Biden, but I'm gonna put them towards Trump. And there's supposed to be these laws that are kind of basically punishing them, but there's no, like in the moment, there's not really much you can do about that. When did we actually vote for the electors? I don't even know who our electors are. 
Yeah. Well, that's interesting because the, the actually the individual political parties are the ones who basically like nominate and decide um, who they want their electors to be. And then, so then for example, like all, maybe all of the Democrats, they, in like California, they're like, okay, the Democratic Party of California chooses these 55 people to be our delegates so that if we, if the Democratic Party wins California, then they're the people who are going to go vote. But versus the Republicans will also have 55 people so that if they win California, they're going to go vote. And you're right. And, and, and often there's faithless, faithless electors sort of cast their vote in opposition to what they were supposed to just as, as a sound of a protest and when they don't affect the outcome of the election. So they were actually faithless uh, voters for against Trump and against Hillary Clinton in, in 2016, several. But, but this thing you just mentioned about the state mandating the electoral their electoral people to vote certain way. That's been sort of talked about a bunch with um, with Pennsylvania in this election, right? So the the, the Pennsylvania's uh, uh, Republican state legislature might declare that their electoral votes are going to go to to like Trump, regardless of what the outcome of the election is, right? And that that could happen. There's nothing that prevents that legally, constitutionally, otherwise. So we have another raised hand, Deborah. Hi, yeah. I'm uh, visiting from Brooklyn. I'm a former student of Stanley, Professor Chang. Um, he invited me and uh, I did. really the presentation. Um, I have a question about, and forgive me if you covered this and I just looked away when you happened to be talking about it, but did you discuss the um, super delegates? That was something Sorry. I feel like that came up in the 2016 election. Were okay. super delegates? I'm not, I remember hearing about that, but I'm not sure specifically uh, who they who they were. Do you, do you remember? Yeah, I don't, I know of superdelegates, but I actually don't know what they are and what they do. If someone does, you should chime in. I think yeah, those apply more to primaries. Those are, yeah, that's the, those are associated primaries. That's right, yeah. They are, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think that has to do with the primaries. It's the, yeah. It's the party specific delegates with the yeah. You have another? There's a question in the chat. Yes, I was just, well, let me make sure that this question got answered. All right. Uh, the question in the chat says, what would the mechanism or next steps be to introduce the change with respect to electoral college? Okay. Oh, good um, question. That is a good question. So there's, uh, it kind of depends on what kind of change you want to implement. So kind of the, the quickest uh, solutions that we should do would, would be to, in context of keeping the Electoral College, what can individual states do? So kind of the one that really got put into place right after the 2016 election, I remember hearing about it then, um, is this National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So actually, I think, I think in this election, there are a couple of states like Colorado um, has it's even though it's technically part of this compact, it's actually suspended there right now because they have it up for a referendum. So these states can put up to their populations referendum saying like, do we wanna join this compact? So that kind of seems to be the one that states can take into their own hands, um, barring uh, separate from any more larger national change. And then another one would be with regards to the Wyoming rule and thinking about how we a portion, which is something that Rebecca is going to talk about, because there's no really, like the there's no really reason that we have 435, and so that's another change that could be made is is looking at our portion system, which could then lead the electoral college to be more fair, and then on the grand scale, like long term, with the hope of actually abolishing the electoral college. In order for that to happen, a bill would have to be proposed, and then it would have to first go through Congress and then go out for ratification to the states. So that's much more long term. When did the number 438 become codified? Oh, um, so 435, that is in the number of representatives. Oh, right. Was that in 1929? 1929, the Apportionment Act, right. which I'm, I'm sure we'll hear about and from Rebecca also. But it's this thing that's been sort of forced on us for the last 90 years for no good reason. So the apportionment act says you cannot have any more than that or? No. 
So have there been attempts to overturn it? That I don't know. You could lead the charge, Professor Chang. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Re Rebecca probably has the answer to that. <coughs> we can either answer now or, or, or keep the suspense. For the <laughs> either way. One thing would be to, so how did Maine and Nebraska, how did they, so, so, so most states uh, have a winner take all thing, right? Whoever is the plurality winner gets all the electoral votes. So how did Maine and Nebraska enact this different thing where they do it proportionally? So in the same reason as since the constitution lets states choose how they want to apportion uh, to give out their electoral votes. So since all of these states used to have it so that the state legislator would choose basically who the electoral electors were and then the electors would go vote. So this was back when the electors were less symbolic and more real people who made the decision. Um, and so in the same way that all of these states changed to do the popular vote just by a state act. I don't really know how state work, states work because I'm not from a state. Um, but we like they can just do that. So they could just put this process into place um, and pass it through the state legislator or do a referendum, I assume. So might that be another direction of action like work in your state to change the winner take all? Yeah, definitely. Process. Yeah, that would be another another way uh, to do it on the state level. Does anyone know how the three fifths came into why why three fifths? Again, as a mathematician, like when a when a fraction like that randomly appears, I, I wonder why. Why not? You know, I don't know. Nine fourteenths. there well here let me expand that question and, and then i'll stop bothering you so you said if <laughs> if you want to pass a constitutional amendment right a couple of things have to happen first the congress has to ratify it with two-thirds of the votes right both in the house and the and the and the senate right and then two so two-thirds and then three-fourths of the states have to ratify it as well right okay so where did the two-thirds and the three-fourths come from I've, I've asked this question in our private conversations once or, or you know, with the fellows, but, but I, I just, it, it bugs the hell out of me. I remember Professor Chang saying that it's like kind of when you think about like, if someone has to choose like a fraction, you would say like one half. And then it's like, oh, if you have to choose something over one half, you want to preserve this like n over n plus one. So know, that's yeah. right. So that's why you would choose like two thirds or three fourths. And then three fifths kind of comes as if you have to choose something some little more time. But why do you have to preserve the n and over n plus one? Because it's prettier. Because people are again too stupid to understand anything that's not n over n plus one. Well, three and five are both Fibonacci numbers, right? <laughs> I'm sure the founders had, had that. Right, they are Fibonacci numbers. So you know, so I mean, the Fibonacci numbers, the the ratio of the Fibonacci numbers converts the golden mean, right? So <laughs> so. I think you're giving the legislators way yeah, too much credit. <laughs> but uh, it does say, I found a, a, evidently one half was proposed and three fourths were proposed and neither side could make any traction. So they settled on three fifths, which was initially proposed by James Madison. <clears throat> but see, that was probably tossed out there. We're just like, oh, let's do three fifths. It, it, my point is that if you have as complicated and as messy a process as amending the constitution, the, the quantities associated to it, there is no way they're going to be as clean as two thirds and three fourths, right? Nothing in, in nature is two thirds and three fourths. Ask, you know, Planck's constant and the Euler number, right? So it seems arbitrary at best and not we'll, we'll throw it out, so we'll throw it out. So it's like, oh, we need something more than a half. You know, like, oh, how about two thirds? That's, yeah, okay, fine. And now we are living our democracy under the, the sometimes tyranny of these simple numbers that not very much thought has gone into, I guarantee you, because they're so simple, All right? Okay, I'll, I'll shut up now. We should probably go on. So let's, let's take a couple minute break. Unless uh, there are any final questions or, or comments.
and then uh, so all right rebecca's on report from her father about who is a constitutional uh, historian so we'll have our answer in two minutes when we come back from a break <laughs> We have 99 people registered. I just want to hit 100. Doesn't matter how many are actually in the <laughs> following the talks. I just want 100 registrations. All right, we should get going again, maybe, to keep on schedule. So if there's anybody new who joined us in the last few minutes, um, we, you can uh, post questions or comments into the chat, or afterwards raise your virtual Zoom hand and, and we'll uh, We'll call on you, uh, and this is being recorded. Although you will not show up in the recording unless you're unless you're speaking, so nothing to worry about. Uh, and we have we talked about Fibonacci numbers a few minutes ago, so Professor Ching is telling us what they are in the in the chat. In case you wanna wanna work on some light math during the during the next talk. So the next talk is by Rebecca Yi, another one of our fellows of the Institute of Math and Democracy. And uh, she's a math major and a religion minor. Uh, she's a junior. And she will talk about apportionment. OK, I'll share my screen. OK, so yes, like um, Professor Bullich just said, I'm going to be talking about apportionment. Or, in other words, how we decide how many seats that each state gets. Okay, here's a look at the census results, I mean the census results, the apportionment results from 2010. And as you can see, the states in orange each gained, um, each lost a seat, while the states in blue each gained a seat. And then the states in gray saw no change. So the question is, how were these numbers determined? So yeah, how do we decide how many seats each state gets? Here's a little bit of history. So 
In our constitution, it says that representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers. So it doesn't actually specify a method. It just says that it's gonna be according to their respective numbers. So in reality, this is, means that we reapportion after every census. So the next reapportionment will be, should be decided by January of this coming year. And the initial house actually only had 59 seats in 1789 and the house grew every year or every 10 years. Um, and initially this number meant that one representative represented 30,000 people. So this number, as we probably heard if you were here earlier from um, Eliza's presentation, was locked at 435 in 1929 from the Reapportionment Act of 1929. And today one representative actually represents 755,000 people. And just a fun fact, if we were to use one representative as 30,000 people, today we would need 11,000 um, representatives, which is crazy. Okay, so we're gonna look at four methods for apportionment that have been used throughout history and a lot of the problems that actually arise from them. The first of these methods is Hamilton's method. So this was used from 1852 to 1911, and it was actually proposed in 1792 when they were deciding on the very first apportionment method, but it was vetoed by Washington. More on that later. I won't actually go into that right now. So here's how it works. Suppose there are four states and 20 seats in our small hypothetical country. So we're going to first calculate the standard divisor, which is the total population divided by the total number of seats, which is 594.1. So in other words, the standard divisor is basically how many people each seat should represent. And then we're going to calculate the quota for each state, which is the state population divided by the divisor and then rounded down. Hamilton says to round, round down. So this will give us how many seats each state should get. So we do that calculation here. So state A gets a quota of 4.31, state B population divided by the standard divisor, again, 594.1 and we get 5.58, and we do that for C, and we get 1.67, and then we do that for D, and we get 8.44. Okay, and then we round down, so four, five, one, and eight. Okay, and then if you notice that adding up these seats actually only gets us to 18 seats because we've rounded down. So what do we do with the last two seats? Well, Hamilton says, take the leftover decimal from earlier, C4.31, we take the 0 0.31, 0 0.58, 0 0.67, and 0.44, and then we give the two seats to the states with the largest leftover decimal, which in this case is state C and state B. And then now that's the final apportionment, and that adds to 20. Okay, but here are some problems with Hamilton's method. The first of these is the Alabama paradox. So the Alabama paradox is when an increase in the total seats actually causes a state to lose a seat, even though nothing happened to the state's population. So this was discovered in the 1880s when they were testing out a house size increase from 299 to 300 and realized that Alabama would actually lose a seat while Texas and Illinois gained a seat each. So this is a problem because we don't want increasing the house size to mean that a, a state would lose a seat unnecessarily. Okay, the second of these paradoxes is um, a population paradox. So this occurs when a faster growing state loses a seat to a slower growing state. So this was discovered in 1900 when Virginia actually lost a seat to Maine, even though Virginia's population was growing at a faster rate than Maine's. So to understand a little bit more about what the math behind all this is, we can look at another hypothetical population, this time with slightly nicer numbers. And so three total states and 10 seats. So in our initial apportionment, we use Hamilton's on the left side. 
So we can see that our standard quota, because we're dividing by 10 seats, divisor is 1 million. So the standard quota here is 1.45. B is 3,400,000 divided by 1 million, which gives us 3.4. And C gives us 5.15. And so we get two, we get, it would actually be one, three, and five. And then the extra seat goes to the state with the highest leftover decimal. So it goes to state A. And so the final apportionment would be two, three, and five. But here the population shifts a little bit and the overall population shrinks. So the divisor also shrinks. And so now if we calculate the new quota, we see that state A has a 1.55. So its quota increased a little bit because the divisor is smaller now. State B, its quota also increases even though its population shrunk a little bit, the divisor shrunk more. So its standard quota still increases. And then state C shrinks a lot. But notice that because the leftover decimals changed, when we round now, we round down one, three, and four, the extra C actually goes to state B. So even though state B's population shrunk, state B actually gains a seat while state A's population grew, but state A loses a seat. So that's problematic. We don't want um, a faster growing state to lose a seat to a slower growing state. Okay, and here's the new state paradox. So when the introduction of a new state results in an existing state losing a seat. And this is also known as the Oklahoma paradox because it was discovered when Oklahoma became a state in 1907. So when Oklahoma became a state, they recalculated all of the quotas and found that Oklahoma would have five electoral college votes. So they, um, five seats. So they added the five seats to the um, total number of seats. So we have 391 seats now, but then when they recalculated the quotas for all the other states, all the states stayed the same except for New York and Maine. Where New York and Maine actually exchanged a seat there. So New York, lost a seat while Maine gained a seat, even though their populations didn't change before and after Oklahoma was introduced. But the introduction of Oklahoma seemed to disrupt how many seats they got. Okay, so since the Hamilton's method seems a little bit problematic, we're gonna look at another method. So here is Jefferson's method. So this was in use from 1792 to 1842, and it's the method that beat Hamilton's method um, back in 1792. So the only difference when it was proposed was that Jefferson's method would have given Virginia an extra vote um, from Delaware, which as you all know, Virginia is Washington's home state. So that's probably why Washington vetoed Hamilton's method in favor of Jefferson's method. So Jefferson's method lowers the divisor until it fits the number of seats. The basic idea here is that, so you still start with the divisor as the total population divided by the total seats from Hamilton's method. And then we computed it and we had two seats left over, if you recall. So Jefferson says that instead of just giving these two seats to the highest leftover decimal, we should try lowering the divisor. So um, he just tries a nice lower number. There's no specific way to calculate this number. So now if we compute 550 with our, as our divisor, we find that the seats apportioned are four, six, one, and nine, and that actually adds to all 20, so that worked. That's great, we'll just keep the 550 divisor then. Okay, so Jefferson's method does actually avoid some of the paradoxes, but it runs into another problem, which is the failure of the quota rule, where the quota rule is the apportioned seats, is that the apportioned seats should lie between the upper and lower roundings. So in this case, as you can see, state D under Jefferson's method actually ends up with seven seats, even though its upper and lower roundings are five and six. So we don't want a state getting disproportionately more seats than its quota. And also note, that the lower divisor actually favors larger states because a larger population divided by a slightly lower divisor will increase the quota more 
than a lower divisor divide, um, dividing a smaller population. So Jefferson's method favors larger states disproportionately. Okay, so we've looked at those two methods. Here are two other methods that have been used. Webster's method is like Hamilton's, but uses traditional rounding. So Webster's method says, just if the leftover decimal is above 0 0.5, round up. If it's below, round down. And in this method, we actually get the same as Hamilton's in this hypothetical scenario, but it can also fail the quota rule because, um, yeah, I think it's because uh, the house size can change with this one. Okay, and then there's Huntington Hills. So this is actually the one we currently use. So it's like Webster's, but it rounds with the geometric mean. So um, the geometric mean is, um, in this case would be the lower quota times the upper quota and then square rooted. So with four and five, for example, that would be four times five square rooted, which is 4.47. And then if the quota is greater than the geometric mean, we round up. So if it's 4.48 in this case, you would round up to five. Whereas if the quota is less than the geometric mean, you would round down. So 4.46 goes to four. And we compute it again for states A, B, C, and D, and we get four, six, two, and eight. But note that the geometric mean tends to favor smaller states over larger ones. See, if we have a small state with a small quota, one and two, the geometric mean is 1.41, where that four one is a little closer to one than it is to two. Whereas with eight and nine, we would get a geometric mean of 8.49, where that four nine is closer to five and closer to nine now. So it's harder for a larger state quota to round up than it is for a smaller state's quota to round up. Okay, and here's a summary of the methods we've looked at plus a few others that have been proposed. Um, and as you can see, there's no method that satisfies yes across all categories because we want the quota rule and we don't want paradoxes, right? So is there any method actually that can satisfy all of these categories? That brings us to the Belinsky-Young theorem, which says, no, that is actually not possible. Um, you will always have to choose between either satisfying the quota rule or eliminating paradoxes. And you can't have both at the same time. So the 4.35 here is just a hypothetical quota and what to do with it. And officially stated, it just says that, yeah, no apportionment method can satisfy all the following ideal criteria at once, which is again, the quota and that nothing weird happens with the population. Um, nothing weird happens with the seats when the population changes or a new state is introduced. And if you've heard about Arrow's impossibility theorem, which says that there's no perfect um, ranked choice voting method. It's actually very similar in spirit because again, it's that there are these ideal criteria that we'd like to have in our system, but we can't satisfy them all at once. Okay. And then here is an example of in why apportionment methods really matter. So in the 1876 election between Hayes and Tilden, Hayes won with 185 electoral college votes, while Tilden won, um, Tilden received 184 and won the popular vote and actually won with a majority too. Um, under Webster's method, Tilden actually would have won over Hayes with 185 electoral college votes. And um, with, while Hayes would have gotten 184. So as you can see, the apportionment method actually makes a huge difference here. Okay, and then finally, Belinsky and Young from the Belinsky and Young theorem actually argue for Webster. So this is a study that they've done um, where they were looking specifically at small versus large state bias in each of the apportionment methods. And they argued that Webster's method here is actually the least biased of um, all of the methods proposed. But um, they were also specifically looking for small state bias because 
um, Webster's method, Hill's method, Dean's method, and Adam's method are all all tend to be small state biased. So they actually the the methodology behind how they did this study might have over accounted for small state bias. So it actually may have shifted all of these down a little bit. So in reality, it might be a little higher. But the point is that there's just this ongoing discussion about which method is actually the least biased between small and large states and which method is actually the best to apportion our seats. Okay, and that's it. Awesome, excellent. I keep uh, forgetting to put my, there you go, the clapping hand. <laughs> So Rebecca, can you go back to your yes, no chart? Yes. So which one is being used at the moment? Oh, Huntington Hill, yeah. Even though it says no, like it's mostly no, right? Yeah. Do you, do you have a sense of why Huntington Hill was chosen as the method? Mm -hmm. why, why did they feel like because they were using Webster's method for a while. And was that the one previous to Huntington Hill? I believe it was, yeah. So, so actually- How did they decide to change it? Yeah, I read that it was because they were looking at the five divisor methods, which I believe are um, Adams, Dean, Huntington Hill, Webster, and Jefferson, or yeah. And then they were looking at the small and large state bias. And they decided that relatively speaking, um, Huntington Hill was like the middle one of the five, even though they're all small state, I mean, four of them are small state biased, while one is large state biased, and they decided that just because it was the middle one, relatively, that it was the best method. There was some politics behind it as well, supposedly. I don't quite know what, what, what that was, but it was not all math, from yeah, what I understand. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I don't quite recall either, but I, that was actually the mathematical argument made for it, but there was definitely some politics behind it too. And Belinsky and I actually also came up with an apportionment method, but but it was very complicated and they didn't think it was, I forget why they didn't push push for it to be used. And and it was better than any of, the, of these methods. Uh, but then they said, okay, if we're not using ours, then we should really be using Webster, like you said. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Are house monotonicity and the avoidance of the state paradoxes mathematically desirable for any reason or only politically desirable to avoid angering states? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I think Generally speaking, because rounding is always going to change how many people your representative represents, that if you change the, like when a state loses a vote versus gaining a vote, it could still change the overall representation pretty dramatically. So I, I do think, I do think it actually, I think it's, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I'm not actually entirely clear on that. I mean, so the entire problem is is how to deal with the fraction. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that turns out to be the whole, because we don't give fractional numbers of votes, right? I mean, if you gave, if, if votes were allowed to be fractionalized, then this apportionment thing wouldn't be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is different ways of, manipulating the, the fraction <clears throat> gives you really widely different results. Well, not maybe not widely, but it'll differ by like one vote or two, right? And yeah. that, that could be very important. So I guess that the, I mean, there are certain kinds of fairness rules that we're trying to keep. Like if your population you know, it doesn't change, you know, should you lose a seat? Or, you know, if your population is growing really fast, should you lose a seat? There are all these sort of, uh, you know, paradoxes or, or desirable things that you want in your formulation that, you know, I mean, 
none of it is perfect. I mean, I guess what we're trying to do is we're trying to define what it means to be fair, right? You know, and it turns out that no matter how you decide, I mean, someone has to decide what it means to be fair. So you come up with a list of axioms and then you try to implement that somehow. And part of the problem behind all of these methods is that inherently you come up with, like there's no actual way of getting all the fairness method or the fairness axioms that you want, right? Um, so I think in, in, you know, I mean, the idea behind, it's sort of flawed to begin with because everyone's definition of what it means to be fair is also flawed, right? <laughs> in a way, you know. I, yeah, the, the math itself doesn't care, right? It's like, you know, there, there's this procedure, the mathematical procedure, and then there's consequences of it and there's the fallout of it, right? So, so the math is unbiased, but, 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 but it's really, right, but when you start thinking about what seems to be fair politically, right, then you start thinking maybe I should amend the math, right? But it's not inherently in, in, in the math itself, there's no conflict, right? It's just, it's a process. It's, you know, in paradoxes, we call them paradoxes. They're not paradoxes. They're just consequences of the mathematical process, right? So, so you know, if you were, if you just look at the math, you don't care. But, but, but right. yes. But the problem is deciding which way to round, right? I mean, yeah. and that's a, that's, that's something that as humans, we had to impose upon the system, right? Like, and, and that is a decision that, that is, that comes up, that is inherently flawed, right? There's like no right way of choosing the rounding mechanism. So um, it's kind of like the, the human inability to find the right, the right configuration, right? That, that yeah. makes it difficult, right? right. Rebecca, can you say, I have the question, can you say more about this? So you said this number 435 has, we mentioned this earlier, but maybe we can say something about this. You know, it's been around since 1929. The house stopped growing, it grew, but then it stopped. Like, mm -hmm. What happened? Yeah, I mean, uh, I believe the act was passed largely because there is a lot of anti-immigration policies trying to get passed at the time. And in order to ensure enough support for those policies, this um, apportionment actually kind of just manipulated that support in order to um, further those policies. So it, was, it wasn't actually, it didn't actually have much to do with apportionment at all. No, exactly right. So, right, the way I understood it is when I was reading about this a while ago is that, so in 1929, it was a Republican run Congress, both the House and the Senate. And, uh, and there was this influx of immigrants into urban areas. So urban areas were growing. And if, if the house were to increase according to the population increase, those urban areas would have more votes, right? Because they simply, they had more population. So the, the power of the rural uh, America would be sort of diminished under this, uh, under continued increase of the house. So that's why Republican Congress in 1929 passed this re re apportionment, reapportionment act. I forget what exactly it's called, but, but we are really for the last 90 years, we have been living with this number 439, which absolutely makes no sense from like 800 points of view anymore. It is absolutely ridiculous that this, you know, when you ask some, some uh, representative of Congress would ask what they thought about increasing the size of the, uh, the implementing the Wyoming rule right make the make the house big enough so that electoral vote corresponds to a, a same unit of population all across all across the country and they said yeah of course this makes sense except if you tell people that we have to increase the congress the house by 110 seats which is what this would require they would you know there'd be riots in the streets right so i don't know i think sort of a cheap excuse i think if you educate the people that this this would actually bring about more equitable uh, system that people might might go for it but yeah this 435 every time i hear 435 or 538 i just like shudder in like mathematical horror that this is the number we're, we're stuck with for the last 90 years for really no no good reason
I mean, so so is it the case that you know most people would not want a larger house? Is because their immediately thought their immediate thought was we have to pay these people out of right. our taxes, right? And we have right. just more people who are getting salaries and great benefits uh, exactly. at our expense, right? And everybody hates politicians these days, and it would just mean like more like more crap in Washington, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, uh, that's really the yeah. But there really is no. So, if the Wyoming rule were instituted, how many members of the House would there be? Rebecca, do you know? Do you remember? I actually, think so. I'm actually clear on that. Uh, Eliza, yeah. Yeah, I think it was 547. Right. The, so you'd add about 100, is that 100, to the house? Yeah. 110. No, it's not, it's not that much, really. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah the fourth, more, 25% in, increase or something. Yeah. What else do we have as far as questions go, comments? Anyone else? All right, well, we can take a break till, so the next thing is at seven, we're gonna hear about gerrymandering. Uh, if anybody, I mean, I'll, I'll stick around if people have questions or anything, but let's, let's take an official break.
people frantically reloading their favorite news source because I'm not doing it. I think I'm staying off all that stuff until later in the evening. Smart. Very smart. Professor Chang says he has not looked at anything yet either today. I don't I've just it. been eating chocolate because I just can't deal. <laughs> <laughs> My house is full of chocolate wrappers. Yeah. I literally disinvited my boyfriend from coming over tonight because he wanted to watch election stuff. And I was just like, nope, not doing that. See that's, that's not what boyfriends are for. What do they do? I mean, they must be just like tabulating what precinct stuff? Precinct? Exit polls. Exit polls, like 1% reporting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, all my like Bosnia, you know, people from Bosnia texting me all day, like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm not okay. <laughs> <No way. laughs> what else can I tell you? I'll probably be curled up on the floor sobbing <laughs> later tonight. <laughs> but we're not expected to know until what? Tomorrow? A few days, probably. Why? They're saying they're saying we might know Florida by the end of the to like late. Why is it more, I mean, like like in previous elections, it was pretty much decided on that evening, right? There weren't as many mailing votes, I think. Oh, are they still counting them? Some states haven't even started. Some states are not allowed to start till election day. Oh, really? I'm trying to figure out, like there, are, there were what? I mean, there were like 60, over 60 million. Something like that, right? Paper votes, right? Like mm -hmm. who opens those envelopes? I don't really know. <laughs> Volunteers. <laughs> I mean, who, 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 there's 65 million <laughs> envelopes to open. There's going to be a lot of paper cuts in the next few days. <laughs> right. Right. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So most of, I, I forget now, but you know, if you, if there, I don't know, six swing states, I don't know, like four or five aren't allowed to start counting until today. So, like, you're not, you know, you're not going to hear from those states for a while. Why did mail-in ballots become so popular this year as opposed to previously? Because we have this pandemic, this thing called- <laughs> Oh, that's pandemic. right, we have a pandemic. <laughs> we can't leave the house. Yeah. The fact that I've only seen you in 2D last oh, nine months. That's, that's really I mean, I went to vote today and there was absolutely nobody in line. So, mm. um, so I was not in COVID danger. Right. And you still didn't get your sticker. I didn't get my sticker. Yeah. I didn't get my sticker. So when would ranked choice voting come into effect and what uh, offices would it apply to? So it would apply to all state and federal elections in uh, mass, mass, no, not federal, sorry. It would not apply to presidential elections and primary elections. And, but it would apply to all the state elections, state and local elections. So for and, governor and for the mayor and- Yeah, and all the state rest representatives and um, like, you know, like all those obscure things you vote for that you've never heard of, like the distributor of the treasurer of the secretary's office. So Rebecca mm -hmm. wrote, not primaries. Are, are primaries de determined by the party and how they want to deploy it? Yeah, I think so. But I'm not sure. I don't think it's the primaries either because that's like a, that's an election for a, for a national position somehow. Are there local primaries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, like Kennedy, like Elizabeth Warren got primaried. Oh, not Elizabeth Warren, and Mark, you got primary by Kennedy. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. Oh, there's, that's right, that's yeah. right. 
I mean, that's that's a national office, but the state is. Eh. But only only Massachusetts votes for that national office. Right. Anything that the rest of the country votes for. So. Right. Okay. Right. So, for the so primaries. primaries. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm I I meant uh, I thought you meant Rebecca the the presidential primary. Oh, no, I did, and I'm I'm surprised just because all the arguments I've heard for it have mostly been people being upset about how the primaries went. Right. I don't think I think so. I spoke to actually the person who runs the campaign, the S one two campaign, and I th it, they thought they were, wanted to play it a little safer and not impose that huge of a change in the voting system in Massachusetts. Uh, and they were hoping maybe later, if this goes well, the later they will include these these bigger elections. Uh, the one reason they could do it for presidential elections is because they're not they're really not, you know, they're so clearly democratic that they don't. There's no rank choice wouldn't really help. The Democratic candidate usually gets the majority of the vote, and then the ranked choice doesn't matter. You just take that person, right? So, so they could they could be more sort of loosey goosey with presidential elections. I think in Maine it's not so clear. So Maine actually does everything. We're using ranked choice, even the even presidential. Ismar, do you know how uh, how Wellesley chooses its like uh, how our voting system works? I do actually. You it's do. A, it's a is a board account. It's a two stage thing actually. It's right. first, yeah. First, it's and now I don't know which one it is. So it's board account and instant runoff. But I forget which which comes first. I think instant runoff comes first because then you have five candidates moving on to the second round, right? Right. And I think there it's ranked. It's uh it's uh instant runoff. I have, I have a, there's a document that you that one of somebody in my class last year asked for, and uh, Ruth Fromer actually has it in writing and sent it to the student of mine because they were researching how we vote, and it had it changed in the last ten years or something. So there were a few people who decided it should change and sort of push the change through, including I think Sue Keith from Econ and some some other people. So Minerva copied a thing in the into the into the chat about where ranked choice voting would be used, not be used in pre president, but maybe primaries it would be. I don't know. It doesn't say. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure. So should we start? Yeah, let's start. It's seven o'clock. Uh, so again, let me let me should I recap. We are you welcome everyone. We are in the next to last talk of the of the series. Uh, and we'll hear about gerrymandering from Sarah Pargen, who is again one of our fellows. Uh, she's a senior. Uh, and she is she is a math and CS major. She also started this wonderful thing called the Wellesley Data Collective to promote uh, sort of data-driven projects and conversations across across various constituencies and departments in the at, at, at the college so so she's going to tell us uh, about gerrymandering okay cool um let me just share my screen all right um so thanks again everyone for joining us this evening um now we're going to talk about coloring outside the lines uh, specifically about gerrymandering with a focus on the role that mathematicians are playing in US courts and campaigns um, to kind of fight against it. So beyond the basics of what gerrymandering is and what it looks like, which is a little bit of a trick question, but an important one to try and figure out the answer to, uh, we're going to focus on Supreme Court cases where mathematicians have given testimony saying, hey, this is probably gerrymandering based on results from a couple of different mathematical approaches. So first off, as Rebecca just addressed, um, states are split into voting districts, each of which elects one representative to the House for a total of 435. And this map shows uh, the size of districts uh, and how it tends to follow the population of a state and how that's split up and distributed. Uh, redistricting happens based on the census every decade and how the demographics of states change in that time. The federal government has a few loose guidelines for what properties districts should have. So first, they should be compact. This means that they must minimize the minimum distance between all the parts of a constituency. 
Um, so geometrically, a circle, square, or hexagon is the most compact district, as we kind of see is the shape of some of these um, ideal compactness districts in Ohio. But in practice, we've got to consider county borders, which throw off ideal compactness just a bit too. So next, uh, districts must also be contiguous. So this district in Illinois, uh, which as you can see here, is barely contiguous. Um, that's actually a road that no one lives on. Um, it was actually drawn this way to benefit voters of Latinx origin in the area so that they can collectively have better local representation. Some other guidelines include maintaining borders of counties and cities, um, preserving communities of interest like we saw on the previous slide, and keeping the cores of previous districts intact. It's also just good practice to avoid pairing incumbents against each other. But yeah, that's like pretty much it. And these criteria are very hard to discretize if you kind of have noticed. So I guess the question that we want to look at today is what happens when they aren't enough to make sure that voters choose the party and not the other way around? Well, gerrymandering. This is the intentional manipulation of district boundaries for discrimination on the basis of political views or race. The latter, uh, which is called racial gerrymandering, was outlawed by the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but through the former partisan gerrymandering, it has taken on a new form. Before we get to that, I can't really give this talk without touching on this little guy in the bottom left corner. Um, the term gerrymandering is Massachusetts born and bred, courtesy Eldridge Gary, um, who as governor of Massachusetts signed a bill in 1812 that created a partisan district in the Boston area that was so ridiculously shaped, it was compared to a salamander or a gerrymander. So if you thought that cartoon was scary, let's talk about something even worse. Figuring out a rule as to what gerrymandering looks like. These pictures of America's most gerrymandered districts make it look a little easy, but you know, what about now? Now, like without demographic context, it's really hard to tell which of these maps from Virginia was fairer to black candidates in 2016. Um, if you're curious, it was the one on the right, which was created by judges who were fed up with unfair Republican redistricting proposals, like the innocuous looking one on the left. Both parties gerrymander, but it has more often benefited Republicans than Democrats. A few super common ways to do it include cracking and packing. So cracking refers to spreading opposition votes thinly over uh, districts that a party is likely to win so that their impact is minimized. Here, even though purple is in the overall majority on the left, in these cracked districts, purple voters are in the minority. Packing on the other hand refers to stuffing the remaining opposition votes into a small number of conceded districts. So here, each of these two districts is full of purple voters, but it won't help purple win the election because there are more majority green districts. Um, a few other tricks in the partisan gerrymandering handbook include stacking, hijacking, and kidnapping, which sounds criminal, right? But there's actually nothing explicitly in the constitution against partisan gerrymandering, nor does any legislation explicitly outlaw it. Stacking groups low income minorities who are perceived as a voting majority in the same district as high income white voters with higher turnout on average. While hijacking forces two incumbents to run against each other in one district so that one of them has to be eliminated. On the other hand, kidnapping involves moving an incumbent's home address into another district where their reelection can become more difficult. So we know some strategies for gerrymandering, but gerrymandered maps don't necessarily reveal malicious intent. So how do we geometrically quantify gerrymandering? One way is via compactness score. So one of the most popular compactness scores is uh, the Polsby Popper score, which compares a district's area to its perimeter. It measures if there's a lot of like unnecessary perimeter to a district. And so it's close to zero um, if that's true and one for ideal shapes like circles. Um, here, so on the left, we've taken up the perimeter of a district like this and stretched it into a circle. The resulting circles area is much bigger than the area of the district. So the Polsby Popper score is low and this is kind of suspicious. Um, building on the ideal properties of a circle in the Schwartzberg score, we compare the ratio of the perimeter of the district to the circumference of a circle with an area equal to the district's area. Finally, in the Reox score, we compare the ratio of the area of the district to the area of the smallest circle that contains it. There are a lot of these kinds of compactness scores to measure how compact a district is, but there's no good consensus for how to synthesize them to identify gerrymandering. Nor do they re reflect things like demographic realities of districts, but they are kind of cool ways to visualize what goes wrong with gerrymandered districts from a more theoretical point of view. So now let's consider a more concrete approach called the efficiency gap, 
we'll examine how it has been used to fight against partisan gerrymandering in the 2018 Supreme Court case, uh, Gill v. Whitford, along with its limitations along the way. So first, what is the efficiency gap? Um, well, if we bring back the idea of cracking and packing from before, we can see that in cracked districts, all the purple votes are wasted because green will have already had a majority. But in the packed districts, both of these two green votes are wasted because green, uh, for the same reason. The difference in the amount of votes wasted for each party out of all of the votes is called the efficiency gap. And here it's negative 16% favoring the green party. Wisconsin, where Gil v. Whitford is set, has a real problem with gerrymandering. Um, summarizing this quotation by uh, mathematician Wesley Pegden from Carnegie Mellon. The efficiency gap hints at this problem, even though it ignores geography and demographics. So like, as you can see here, over the years, Wisconsin has suffered from a significant efficiency gap of at least 10% benefiting Republicans. In fact, in 2018, um, even though Democrats received nearly 200,000 more votes, Republicans won seats um, won 63 out of 99 seats in the state assembly. In 2018, using efficiency gap results, a few Wisconsinites who voted Democrat argued that the 2011 state legislature map was gerrymandered. They advocated for courts to declare a map unconstitutional, specifically in violation of the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause, if the efficiency gap like of the map exceeds 7%. Unfortunately, as we can see has tended to be the Supreme, Supreme Court sentiment, the majority of justices didn't engage with the mathematical argument. They dismissed the case, setting a guideline that individual voters can't challenge a whole state's voting district map, but they can challenge their own district's map, which makes it tougher but not impossible to challenge state voting district plans. The result coming out of Wisconsin was a little underwhelming, but it didn't deter the fight against gerrymandering nor the use of math in its service. Um, so another case called Rucho v. Common Cause from 2019 made use of a more robust technique in the mathematical community called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So Rucho v. Common Cause was set in North Carolina. And the figure on the top left here is actually a graph that connects North Carolina's districts, which are its nodes here. So Markov chain Monte Carlo is an algorithmic technique from probability that generates a, like a bunch of like millions of different redistricting maps based on randomly traversing um, graphs like this and creating districts out of them. So one of these uh, artificially generated maps is shown right below. Again, this isn't like an actual map, but it was one that was produced through the random graph traversal algorithm, which is called a random walk. So Markov chain Monte Carlo maps are useful for conducting outlier analysis. And on the right here is a plot of the number of Democrats that tended to be elected over all algorithmically generated North Carolina maps. Outlier analysis tells us that the 2016 and 2012 plans are outliers that are less than 1% likely to be chosen over the sampling process, given how few Democrats that they elect. And this tells us that it was unlikely that they were created in an unbiased way. So in 2019, Common Cause, uh, which is a nonprofit, the North Carolina Democratic Party, note that this is a statewide institution, unlike in Gil v. Whitford, uh, who is just a bunch of voters in the area, and some voters too, argued that the 2016 map um, in North Carolina was gerrymandered. Mathematicians even filed an amicus brief, um, or like a friend of the court brief, that demonstrated that the map was a far outlier using the sampling method that we just talked about. Ultimately, again, the court ruled that it was out of their reach now which is a little disappointing again, but it's left the door open to states and Congress to pass laws to curb partisan gerrymandering. So again, despite the Supreme Court's hesitance to engage, the fight has been taken to states and math has followed right along. For instance, Missouri's 2018 Amendment 1, which passed, um, referred to evidence from state maps as efficiency gaps to advocate for redistricting to be handled by nonpartisan state demographers. In the same year, um, Pennsylvania's state Supreme Court struck down a Republican map due to allegations of gerrymandering arising from results from the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling technique. So states might be our best bet, especially given federal aversion to ruling on gerrymandering. This map shows um, actually what redistricting methods look like across all 50 states. And one ideal we can hope for um, is more states with independent election commissions drawing their maps. Some guidelines that have been adopted by states since 2000 include uh, prohibiting drawing districts to favor incumbents, along with prohibiting the use of partisan data to draw maps. 
states also uh, have considered or implemented requirements of competitive districts with an even partisan balance. And actually starting in 2021, um, Ohio is going to require the statewide proportion of districts whose voters favor each party to correspond to the statewide preferences of the voters. So thinking of gerrymandering like this is very new to both the fields of math and law. Um, it tells us that neither of them exist in isolation. And overall, there's so much potential for how mathematical techniques in collaboration with sociology, computer science, political science, and geography can intersect to help protect people's voting rights. Um, thank you. Can you tell us something about the font? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So if you go to the website linked in the bottom right corner, um, uglyjerry.com or .org, um, it'll show you this font that is actually made up of districts that do exist like in the US. Um, so some ones with really weird shapes. For instance, here we talked about the Illinois one that makes up the U in this letter here. Um, but yeah, so these are districts that actually exist and this is like an alphabet that was made out of them. Questions? You can either raise your Zoom hand or, or put it in the chat. Or, or just speak up, I guess. Julia. Um, can, thank you, Shreya, that was amazing and very timely as this whole event is. Um, can you speak more about who the mathematicians are that are doing this kind of work? That's really interesting to me. And like, how could, like, what kind of career is that? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, it's really exciting. And let's see. So there are a few different groups that are doing some relevant work on this. Uh, one that I cited was the metric geometry and gerrymandering group um, from Tufts. And it's actually like, it's, it was started by a mathematician um, who has kind of like an abstract math background, like including like topology and things like that. Um, but it's grown to include like statisticians and computer scientists uh, who are doing a lot of work to look at some of the more complex ways of modeling um, these kind of problems, including using like graph theory and like other sampling approaches. So that's really cool. There's also the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, which, which does other projects like that. And then uh, a group of three folks over at Carnegie Mellon who have also like uh, either like published research or like these other groups contributed to amicus curiae briefs to help out with Supreme Court decisions. So yeah, really exciting work. So they're mainly centered at universities at the moment. Yes, yeah. There's a group at Duke also who, who does it. But it's, it's mostly been an effort by, by statisticians, data scientists. The fact that abstract mathematicians are, are getting involved is a, is a new thing. And, and it's, it's sort of, it's sort of injected this whole new point of view and new enthusiasm into this, into whole gerrymandering story because some really powerful machinery is being brought down from like the abstract cloud of, of mathematics down to the, to the real world. And then in combination with data science and, 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 and statistics, it's actually doing really amazing things. And this person at Tufts, uh, Professor Moon Duchin, who, who actually came and gave a talk at Wellesley a few years ago, uh, when she was just starting this up. She started out sort of like Professor Ching and I, you know, she taught a class on voting theory just for fun and, uh, and got interested in this and then went to some talk at a conference where she saw some of these maps drawn and, and you know, in passing heard about gerrymandering and that's how it all started. Now her lab at Tufts has 12 full-time employees and they have a, you know, they're working with an MIT group as well. And so, one of our new faculty in the CS department, Brian Brubach, who just gave a talk the other day on gerrymandering, does this kind of data analysis and gerrymandering. He's a person who is affiliated uh, with the Institute of Math and Democracy. And I, was ju I just emailed with him the other day. He's willing to get more involved in the stuff that we do and supervise research and sort of work with students. So if you're interested, I would, I would talk to him as well. We have a question from Liz. What's something that surprised you when you were learning about this, Shreya? Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's no secret like that this is like super complicated to do. That's why there are like whole groups of people at these great schools who are working on this, um, including like our group here. 
Um, but I was surprised that still, like, despite all of the work that's coming out of like this kind of research, the Supreme Court isn't very receptive to it yet. And they're basically like, you know, pushing, like pushing it to states and I guess like to Congress as well um, to really pick up the slack on, you know, handling these kind of arguments or this kind of stuff supporting uh, gerrymandering cases. So I'm wondering like, you know, how that will evolve like with time or like depending on who's on the court, but it appears that the trajectory is one where they're not engaging with the mathematical arguments as much as they maybe should be. Um, and I'm just like curious, like why that could be. Can you say a little bit math. about, can, can you say a little bit about how states be district in the first place? I mean, is it, 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 do they do it every year? Is it based on the census? Like who gets to do it? Do the parties get to do it? Um, so- can you, can you um, say a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good chart. Yeah, this map is really helpful for answering just that question. Um, but yeah, I think it's just like based on the census data for like, I know there are also different kinds of like contests too. So like maps are drawn like all, all the time, as you saw, like I was showing maps from like 2011, 2012, 2016, 2018, like all of that. So um, I'm guessing it's like a pretty like routine process that there are at least maps that are kind of like going through, you know, this process of like deciding on what the final one will be. But as opposed to, or like in terms of who is actually doing this, um, you can see like who has the power like in these states. A lot of the states here have like a state legislature um, that is like doing this redistricting stuff and then the governor can like veto the map. Um, a few of these states are starting to have like actual like independent commissions, um, which is kind of the like most ideal form because you don't have that partisan bias that might otherwise affect the process. But then there are a lot of ways like in between, as you can see here. But like your, your map on Wisconsin showed that there was a, a redistricting every like two years or something. Yeah, um, I think like also so with the Wisconsin case, this was like for the state legislature map. So I feel like the process like varies maybe depending on like what level you're looking at. Oh, so there are different, oh, so for different types of elections, there are different districting. Right, yeah. Oh man. I, I think it just for federal districting, right? For, for the house, you just do it every 10 years unless the courts say you have to redo it. And unfortunately, Massachusetts, our own state, does not have an independent districting commission, which is terrible because we are usually one of the leaders in progressive politics like this. But we do, we're not one of the however many 11, 13 states that have independent, independent commissions. But there's this famous, I'm sorry, I'm in, I keep interrupting, but I just, I, I, this anecdote is, that I learned of as I, as I was learning about this stuff too. So North Carolina is one of the most gerrymandered states. Uh, it got mentioned here. Uh, and the way it got redistricted in 2010 under Republican uh, legislatures, three guys literally went to a Holiday Inn for the weekend, lock, hold themselves up in a hotel room for three days and redistricted the state on behalf of the, of the Republican party of, of North Carolina and came, you know, emerged <laughs> with a new districting map. And of course, with modern day tools of, you know, Google Maps and stuff, you can do this with surgical precision. You can, there are literally the districting lines that go straight in a, along a street, then, then include a house <laughs> and then keep going down the street. I mean, this, you can get to this level of detail with gerrymandering house by house to make so this is one of these like kidnapping things or whatever they're called. This is how this is how they're done. You can redistrict so that an incumbent suddenly lives in a different district. Because was, be, was that redistricting approved? Yeah, but then went into courts, I think, and I'm I'm not sure what the but it is, but that's how it's done in, in most states. Most of it is therefore approved. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, we have some more a question. questions here. We have, a, uh, is there a communication barrier between mathematicians and politicians? <laughs> I can't answer that. Are there staffers or outreach efforts to address this? So I'm not, I can't like speak as much to the like actual like political office side to like what's happening like in the courts themselves. But I know that at least like the point of initiatives like, you know, the group at Tufts or Princeton or like 
uh, the election lab at MIT and stuff is to develop reports or briefs that are accessible um, like for use in the courts. So like, for instance, the briefs that, you know, were used for these couple of court cases that mathematicians had contributed to, um, they really like going through them, there weren't like a lot of like complicated figures or equations or anything. It was very much about converting to, you know, text that is accessible to the justices or whoever else might be working with them. Um, yeah, so like on the other hand, if anyone has more information of what that looks like um, in terms of like engagement from people like working in the courts, um, feel free to pitch in, but yeah, it doesn't sound like there is much given that like these rulings don't really incorporate that evidence, even though it's all there. There's I mean, not there, a lot of there's not a lot of communication between like mathematicians and any other group, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we tend to, we tend to be an insular crowd. There is a American Mathematical Society has an outreach office in D.C. that tries to sort of do these things for us, but it's not you know. I mean, politicians like most population, as soon as you say math, you know, math, or I'm a mathematician, there's just like an instant glaze over, you know, that, that happens. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, of the methods being used to measure or detect gerrymandering, do you have a favorite? Um, okay. I think, let me see. I, I think the Markov chain method is really cool just because um, I don't know, first of all, I just think like these abstract representations of like states as these graphs um, that you can generate like millions of potential maps from is really interesting. Um, so it's kind of like cool to see that sort of like abstract combination of like graph theory and probability and stuff being used uh, to actually produce like, like real maps like this one you see here, like that could, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell that that was like artificially generated, but it's actually more equitable than, you know, some of these, you know, politician generated maps that we're seeing. So I, I think this method is really cool. And unlike the other ones, it doesn't really reduce, you know, this whole complicated issue of gerrymandering into like one single number. So that's the other thing. Like, I feel like we can't pretend that, you know, if you just convert things into like one score or whatever, or like a percentage that you're capturing the reality of like what's happening or like who is being impacted more than other people. So again, like these things don't exist in isolation, but there are a lot of cool techniques that are like coming up. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, looking at the Gill versus Whitford slide, is there a specific reason for 7% being chosen as a threshold? That's, that's a good question too. Yeah, so, okay, the efficiency gap isn't like a very old metric. It was actually, I think some folks at MIT came up with it and in their like paper that they wrote about it, they said that 8% is like a good threshold for counting like maps as like constitutional or not. Um, I don't know where exactly they got that from. It's probably in their paper. Um, but I think the 7% is just kind of like a little stricter version of that maybe. So I think like that paper helps inform, you know, where these things should lie. That's a great answer. And I think that uh, even if you read the paper, it's not totally clear from what I gather. It just, it, to them, it seemed like the right number. So again, you know, it's not really, doesn't seem rigorous enough. Uh, can you clarify how Markov chain Monte Carlo was used in Rucho versus in Common versus uh, Common Cause? Yeah. Um, okay. Let me. I have another figure that shows the results in like a cool way. So this was actually from um, the report that the Tufts group submitted, um, or like as part of the brief. So here, are like kind of plots um, from that group. And the figure shows, you know, you have like two North Carolina districts, District 10 and 11, uh, from the legislature's plan in 2016. And these curves are like histograms of like a million different plans that were sampled using the Markov chain Monte Carlo technique, um, which basically like, like I said before, like it looks at, you know, different ways to randomly move around like a map of a state to generate a redistricting plan. Um, and so the 2012 and 2016 plans were both like proposed and enacted by the North Carolina legislature. Um, the judge's plan, which is the green dot on the map um, or on the plot was kind of made by this like panel of retired judges. So you can see it's like much like more realistic like in terms of what the simulation showed. Um, so in the 2012 and 2016 plans, basically Democrats were like either like packed uh, or like over, uh, packed or like overstuffed into the right-hand um, district and cracked or like more spread out in the left-hand district. 
So uh, you can see that like these are extreme outliers and the sampling approach tells us that because of that, you know, it's very likely that there was some sort of like meddling that was happening because otherwise you'd see it converge to like around the like green line in the middle. Uh, we have a homework problem from, from Professor Ching that everybody can, can work on and, and, then a, and then a question. Uh, why are some states more amenable or successful in pushing for changes to prevent gerrymandering than others? Yeah, I, so I feel like part of it has to do with like who's making the argument or like how, um, how much the argument seems accessible to, hold on, I'm just getting back to the state slide. Um, how much the argument seems like it would not benefit like one party over the other. Cause again, like gerrymandering rulings have tended to favor or favor like Republicans over Democrats. So I think like there's an incentive in some states not to have too much redistricting because that would make it like a more level playing field for Democrats. Um, but then there's also the other way around too in places where Democrats are gerrymandering. So I think it has to do with that like partisan split, um, but also just, yeah, like how accessible the argument is to like people who are like voting on issues like amendment one in Missouri, which actually passed like 60, um, 40 or something maybe more but yeah does the fact that this gerrymandering biases uh, in favor of republicans that democratic regions are more compact um i'm not so, like i'm not i, don't know. I mean like, i don't know <laughs> yeah like for a couple of reasons like i'm not sure if that's necessarily true like depending on what level you're looking at like I'm sure there are like good examples of democratic districts that aren't very compact too. So, um, and for varying various reasons, uh, like good or bad, but um, yeah, I don't know. But as you can see, like the states that tend to have this problem with gerrymandering, like here we mentioned Wisconsin and North Carolina. Well, Wisconsin has like a lot of like just general like embedded segregation anyways, like especially in like urban areas and stuff. So I can see like why those demographics are also playing a role, um, probably similar with North Carolina too. So I know that's not like exactly what you were asking, but just things no, to think about. No, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, Shreya, and going off of that, like I know you mentioned how there was like racial gerrymandering before and now it's kind of switched to more partisan gerrymandering. And I'm wondering kind of how much those two things overlap or right. if, it, if it was like a clean like transition or if there's still a lot of like racial gerrymandering embedded in that partisan gerrymandering. Right. I mean, if you think about like the way people from different like backgrounds tend to vote, I guess like not everyone, but you know, there's like overall patterns, right? Um, I feel like that's how it's kind of taken on a new form in like partisan gerrymandering, right? It's easy for us to slap a label like, oh, this is a red district, this is a blue district, but there are so many other things that you're not taking into consideration when you just make that, you know, like overall summary. Um, so I definitely think that things that like were more like partisan or were more like racial gerrymandering focused and like stuff that the Voting Rights Act, which is also kind of like getting diluted now a bit too, um, was trying to address have seeped into like partisan gerrymandering. And I think I also mentioned like examples where you try and look like you're doing like a service to uh, like minority groups. Um, I think it was like in way back in my example of different kinds of gerrymandering, but um, here you kind of like group everyone together so it seems like they're in a majority but then they're not necessarily the ones who have the highest turnout especially compared to wealthy white voters um, who turn out like much higher in much higher rates so that's like another problem that you can't really answer with just like math or like even these supreme court rulings right because it's you know ultimately getting people to vote or like participate in the process the way you win court cases against gerrymandering is by exhibiting that a political gerrymander is really a racial gerrymander because political is allowed, racial is not allowed, right? So let me just read a couple. So to, the, to, the, to, to Professor Chang's question on, on why are some states maybe more successful, uh, there was an explanation offered that it may have some to do with state constitutional provisions, which may vary in terms of how much support they provide for these arguments, right? How easy it is to bring these arguments to the, to the legislature, right? Then we have another question. What effect do some of the larger proposed changes to elections have on gerrymandering? Right, that's a good question. Would ranked choice voting help to minimize the impact of gerrymandering? Well, 
I don't know, Professor Bullich, if you have like more input or like, I know um, some of the other fellows have touched on like all of these issues too in their talks, but I at least think that like the cool thing about ranked choice voting is that just elections in general are like supposed to be more competitive, um, especially for like other candidates who otherwise, you know, because of the like two party system, for instance, they wouldn't like matter as much, even though they have like a strong influence. So I think overall, like, I would hope that anything that makes the election process as a whole more like equitable or more competitive would also kind of like coupled with like gerrymandering, like action that's being taken um, or like vice versa, sort of make elections overall better. But I'm not sure exactly what that relationship looks like. I should mention that a lot of these things are just not known, right? Um, I mean, we can't even get a grip of what it means to be compact, right? There are so many things that cannot really be nailed down as a definition that is, is just really hard. And so, uh, I mean, I think that part of our institute and other institutes that are, that are popping up are exactly trying to address some of these really difficult questions, right? And these questions, you can't, you can't solve them unless you have data, right? And so, <clears throat> um, so, you know, I mean, for our fellows, for example, some of their future projects might be exactly to try to tease some of this thing, stuff out, right? Like how, how two, two unrelated things or two, two things that are, that are difficult to understand can be decoupled or to, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, we, wouldn't exam we can ex examine their like covariance, right? And so, so this is a fresh field, you know, and, um, and there are lots of unanswered questions that need and, to be and, answered. And I'll just add that, Ms. Shreya, when you started your answer by saying, well, maybe I could say something. I, I was actually asked this question recently and I did not have like a ma good math answer because I, I don't understand. I don't understand the, you know, the stuff well enough, I don't think. But that's an excellent question. And I think people are starting to study this. So this is, this is something I would love to learn more. Like Professor Ching, this is actually the case always in math. Like the most beautiful math happens at the intersection of things. Like if you can bring together these seemingly disparate things in math and prove a theorem about them or something, that's like, that's the coolest stuff. So this is like, you know, social terms or like politics version of that. RCV and gerrymandering, okay, they, they deal with sort of seemingly different things. Is there a way to bring them together? Is there a, is there a correlation? Is there a covariance? Something like so that I would love for it somebody to work on that as their research project and te then teach me about it. Any other questions or comments about any of this? All right. Well, let's take another little break and then we'll hear from Professor Ching in our final presentation in, in, in four minutes. Oh, by the way, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have to, I have to give you. So one of my favorite uh, sources on gerrymandering is John Oliver's uh, presentation on it or show on it. So they, there it is in the. Oh, sorry, I sent it to Professor Chain only. Let me send it to everyone. It's fantastic. It's just uh, twenty minutes of pure gold, as John Oliver often. <laughs> Has. Is it full of F words and <laughs> and ranching? Probably. But he has he has the pic, he uses the picture of the Chicago district that Shreya actually started with, and and there was there was a couple that got married in Chicago and their wedding cake had the picture of that district on it for some reason. So, but it's really yeah I I recommend that. Does gerrymandering happen in other countries? Uh, like not as much. Uh, not as much because 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 why it's it's really like a, a, a clearly an american invention not maybe not invention but clearly they you know we've taken it to a whole different level it's not it's not as bad elsewhere maybe because the political system is such that you're not dividing into districts in 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 these kinds of ways or something yeah
So we will post a video of this whole thing on our IMD website. It's, it's, this might be a good opportunity for us to say a little bit about, you know, the kind of outreach that we can do or we should do. Um, this is sort of our first public forum in a way. Um, it was very timely that we, the Institute started like six months ago um, and, and we're here with you, but um, we're happy to take, you know, uh, some suggestions or advice about, you know, opportunities for the public to learn more about uh, election voting and workshops, um, mm. lectures. So if, if, you know, election voting is something that you're interested in and continue to want to learn more about, right? Um, there are many ways in which we can interface with, with various constituencies. And yeah, we'd love to talk to you. So if you want to talk to us, we're here. Yeah. I put up my thumbs up. Thumbs up, yes. Thumbs up. You're going to do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that Professor Bullich is the brain uh, is the brainchild for this entire process. This is the brainchild of, of his, right? And, and I'm just tagging along. <laughs> I could not, and I could not have done it with, without Professor Cheng. So don't, don't, yeah, it yeah. would not happen without him. But we need we need help. We're growing. We're doing more things. There's more interest. There's clearly, and the population out there that includes a lot of you that that is interested in this kind of stuff intersection of math and 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 you know social justice ultimately right and so you know help us grow and 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 expand our reach so and, and so the tufts group has 12 like employees i think so yeah wow she calls it her lab moon moon Ducci wow. says it's her okay her that's impressive yeah MGG i went to graduate lab. school with moon you know oh you did oh, she I was see. two years below me yeah i see yeah she's it's, it's, it's she does amazing things all right so here we go with our last presentation that is just kind of generically titled math and politics which just gave Professor Chang a license, a license to kill. So, so let's see, let's see what what he has to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Ismore, and and good evening, everybody. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to us as much as we've enjoyed chatting with you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how one can use mathematical, simple mathematical properties to. Um, to quantify various things that you may not think are very quantifiable. So um, what we're gonna talk about in this, in this discussion is you know, very, a, a particular way or some ways in which you can decide how much power does one voter have over another? Okay, we, we've heard a little bit about representation you know, and how much like a Wyoming person has three times more power than somebody in California, but you know, there are other different ways of, of thinking about it. So here's, um, here's, uh, here's, why isn't my thing going forward? You go hit the next. Oh, there we go. Okay, oh, this is weird. All right. So um, we're gonna talk about this thing called weighted voting, okay? And weighted voting is exactly what's happening in the electoral college and in, in lots of other situations. So, let's uh, try to find out a, a sort of a, a numerical way of quantifying an election process very easily, okay? So suppose you have seven voters and they're voting between three candidates, okay? Now your voting mechanism can be one of many things as we saw and, and everything has its problems, right? So for example, you might require a unanimous decision, right? Which is something that often happens, for example, in in department meetings, right? Everybody has to agree because if someone doesn't agree, then you have ill will in the department, you don't want that. So lots of things are divided unanimously, decided unanimously. So if, if A is to win, then A needs seven votes, right? Uh, for a majority, right? A majority vote requires four, right? So 
So in order to get more than 50%, A has to be voted four times. And then there's something called a quota, which is something that the, something that the, uh, the uh, creators of the election, they decide, right? They decide you must have two thirds or you must have three fourths. So the quota is uh, whatever is predetermined by, by the, the, the fashioners of this election. And so, for example, this quota might say, I, you need five to win, right? If, if no one gets five, then nobody wins, right? And so in this case, A has to have at least five. Now you can numerically represent this by a series of numbers, okay? And let's just see how I would do this, right? So in this particular voting scheme, everybody has the same voting power. So everybody gets to cast one vote, okay? And for the unanimous one, I need seven votes to win. So this sort of expression, seven, you know, double bar one, 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 seven is the number of votes you need, okay? And one, 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 is the amount of um, number of votes that each person has, okay? And so in order to meet your threshold, okay, you have to have enough ones to add up to the seven or the four or the five, okay? So um, this is a way that you can represent immediately. Like you can just look at it and say, okay, I understand how this voting scheme works. Now, there are some particular voting schemes that do not fall into this weighted pattern. And, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Okay, so here's an example, right? Um, and this is a, a, you know, this is kind of a, a cool example. So the United States Security Council has five permanent members, okay? The US, China, England, France, and Russia, and then 10 other countries at any given time that rotate through. So currently we have Belgium, the DR, Estonia, Germany, Indonesia, Niger, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, South Africa, Tunisia, and Vietnam. Okay. And the way that uh, an election for, or a vote is, is passed is under the following scheme. Okay. You have to have nine members vote for it. Okay. Nine, nine, nine countries have to vote in order for a vote to pass. And all five of the permanent members can veto it. Right. And so the question is, is there a way to represent this numerically? Okay, and, and here's, a, here's a, a cute way of doing it. Okay, so consider the first long series of numbers. Okay, so 49, well, I'll explain 49 in a little bit. Okay, now the first five numbers represent the people in the, the countries on the Security Council. Okay, and the other ones represent the 10 other countries. So let's just take a look at what's going on here, right? So let's, let's suppose, right, that the United States decides to vote against something or not vote for something, but the other four want to. So how, how many votes, okay, can, is the maximum that they can get. So if the United States sits out, okay, then nine times four is 36. Okay, so you have 36 votes for, from the other permanent members. And even if you add all 10 of the other ones, you're not gonna get to 49, right? So in, in fact, you get to 46 and that's all. So if one, person sits out from the permanent members, then you'll never ever reach 49, okay? So in order for a measure to pass, right, uh, you, need all, you need all five members of the permanent council to vote for it. So that's 45 points, okay? And you need four other countries, right, to make nine. So all I need to do is add four, right? And so 45 plus four, okay? is 49, that's where the number 49 comes from. So this is a, a way of capturing exactly what it means for uh, a, a system to have, like these five countries to have veto power and some other properties that you want. Now, this, this sort of um, representation is not unique, okay? So for example, um, I could have written 39 and then five, five sevens and a whole bunch of ones. Okay, so in this case, if one country of the five sits out, then you have only 28 votes, right? You have 28 plus 10, right? So even if all the other countries voted for it, the exclusion of one, like Russia, suppose Russia decides to vote against it, the most that you can get is 38, okay? And so you cannot get to 39. Um, whereas 
If you have all five countries participating, you only need four more, and that would give you 35 plus four, which is 39, okay? So there's not one particular way, okay, of writing down the numbers. Uh, the numbers, uh, you, you can sort of get it by trial and error a little bit, right? But if two um, representations of a certain voting system yield the same kind of result, they're called isomorphic, okay? So the, the, the first one and the second one, they yield the same kind of uh, relationships, okay? Um, so he, here's an example, right? So the Electoral College, right, has um, 51 different voters, okay? So what we're doing is we're considering every state as a voter with a certain number, certain amount of power, right? So uh, California has 55 votes, okay? But it votes with 55 or zero, right? So if, if California votes for something, then it has a weight of 45. It, it contributes 45 into this. So we can basically consider the Electoral College as being 51 voters, okay? Don't forget DC, all right? 51 voters, each with a certain weight, right? And um, so in order to win, you need 270. Okay, so the election can be encoded by 270 followed by um, 51 numbers uh, that run down from 55 to three, okay. Um, so here's a, here's a trivia question. What is the smallest number other than one and two that don't show up in this list, right? So for example, you know, is there a state with five electoral votes, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? 10? Does anybody have a, a guess? What is the smallest number that does not show up in this list? <laughs> Professor Volich, you want to guess? I don't want to guess because Rebecca answered in the chat. She said oh, what six. Is, she says six. So it turns out that it is not six. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody know what? So Nevada has six. Nevada has six. Iowa has six. And Kansas has six. And Utah has six. And Mississippi has six. So there are lots of, Arkansas has six, okay? So I guess we can spend all evening trying to guess, right? But the answer is 17, okay? So yeah, so 17 is the smallest number for which there is no state with that number of electoral votes, okay? So it, it smears all the way from three up to, up to 16, and then it, there's a gap. Okay. There are certain kinds of of voting mechanisms that cannot be represented in a weighted way, okay? So for example, in the US, right? Um, in order for something to pass, you have to have a majority in the House, you have to have a majority in the Senate, okay? You, the president has to agree, except that he does, if he does not agree, he can veto it, except <laughs> his veto can be overturned by two thirds of the House and the Senate. And lastly, the vice president plays a role and that he can break a tie in the Senate, okay? So this is a really complicated system and you can try to manipulate the numbers to try to make it into a weighted system like we did with the, the, the Security Council, but it turns out that it is not a weighted voting system. So the answer is no, okay? And this is an example of a theorem that a mathematician might be interested in proving. Okay, so mathematicians often are all about bad news. Okay, you give them a voting system and you say, is it fair, right? Can the voting system satisfy these properties, right? And they come back and they say no, right? And so that's an example of a, like an impossibility theorem. Okay, that's what they're called. So it's in, so Arrow's impossibility theorem says that it is impossible to have a voting system with these kinds of fairness requirements. And this proposition, I don't know who did this proposition. Do you, Professor Volich, do you know who proved it? No, I don't actually. So someone, some yeah, mathematician, someone, yeah. yeah, proved that, um, that this kind of mechanism cannot be so easily cast into a weighted system, okay? Um, we should mention that these impossibility theorems are really, really not, not so easy and they're really interesting and in, in fact, Arrow, who is the name of a guy, right? Um, he actually got a Nobel Prize for his work in, in voting theory, okay? All right, so let, let's take a look at some examples on what you might wanna consider to be a power issue. Okay, suppose I have um, three 
uh, free voters, okay? So what do I mean by a voter is I mean a group of people. So for example, uh, group A has 49 members, group B has 49 members, and group D has two members, okay? Now, I'm gonna treat each of these as one voter, okay? Because, because all 49 members of A will vote the same way, okay? So there's no splitting. So you either get 40, you get, you get units of 49, 49, and two, okay? So, um, so we may as well consider them to be three different voters, each with a certain kind of, of weight, right? So, so A and B have the same number of, of, uh, of votes, right? And D has two. Now you might wanna say, right, that A and B have way more power than D like way more power, right? I mean, after all, like it has, you know, over, it has almost 25 times the number of votes as D, but it turns out not to be the case, right? So if you think about it, look at this, look at this uh, particular voting scheme right here, okay? So there are a hundred voters, okay? Or a hundred votes that are being cast, right? And we need 51 to win, that's a simple majority. Now, if you look at this right here, Nobody can win on their own, okay? Nobody can win on their own. So, so A needs B or it needs D to help out, right? B needs A or it needs D. And certainly D cannot win on its own, but it can just choose one other group, okay? And, and, and it'll pass. So basically what we're saying here is that D has the same amount of power as everybody else, right? And so, in this particular system, which you can think about as 51, 49, 49, 2, okay? It turns out that when you, when you actually analyze like the, the, the various cases, it's really isomorphic to 2, 1, 1, 1, okay? So 2, 1, 1 means, two, this 2, 1, 1, 1 means that A, B, and C each have one vote and I need two of them to vote the same way to get to the threshold, okay? so it turns out that D is not 25 times weaker than A. In fact, it's just as powerful as A in this problem. Okay, so that, that's really interesting. So this actually happened, okay, in the Senate in, in 2001. Uh, in 2001, the Senate had exactly the same number of Republicans as Democrats, okay? But one Republican became an independent, right? And so he was, he was his own party. And the vice president was a Republican, okay? So if you include the vice president in the vote, there are 101 voters or 101 votes, okay? And the, the Democrats had 50, the Republicans had 50, and Jim Jeffers has one, okay? And you need 51 to win, right? So no one, right, can win without somebody else's help, right? So this is a very, very crazy example in which you can be like the one person in your party and you can hold just as much power as everybody else, right? They cannot do without you, All right? So, um, so just, right, so, so in this scheme, right? 51, 50, 51, right? D has only one vote, but just as important, okay? So it's no less powerful. So let's take a look at this situation right here. Okay, so let's give D some more, right? So suppose I have 100 uh, votes and A has 26, B has 26, C has 26, and D has 22, okay? So you might say, well, D, D is super, right? D has much more power than it did before, right? But let's see what shakes out in the end, okay? So if I want a simple majority, the scheme is 51, 26, 26, 26, 22, okay? Now let's see what happens with D, okay? Suppose A were on its own, okay? A only has 26 votes, right? It can't win. If, it, if D agrees with A, then D contributes 22, which is only 48, right? So D made no difference. So A was not able to pass it on its own. With D, A is still not able to pass it, so D has no effect on the state of A, right? A is still not able to vote. On the other hand, 
if A, B, and D decided to vote for a particular uh, candidate, right? Then what does that yield? How many is that? I don't know. It's 60, uh, uh, 74, 74, right? So A, B, and D all decide to vote for a candidate. They get 74 votes, which is, is far greater than 51. And, but if you remove D, right, what happens? Well, they'll still have 52 votes, which passes 51. So basically A, B, and D won, okay? But even if you extract D away, they still win, right? So basically what we're saying here is that D has no effect on anything. <laughs> even though it has 22 votes, right? Its participation in both a winning coalition or a losing coalition, right? Will not change the outcome at all. So in fact, D has no power in this situation, even though it has 22 votes. Okay, so so that's that's really really that's really weird. So, you know, just to, to recap, right? If you have, you know, as in the case with uh, the Senate, you know, it, it could happen that D has one percent of the votes, but it has the same influence as everybody else, right? So you you can't say that A has 50, 50 times. I meant I don't mean fifty percent. I meant fifty times. You can't say that. A has 50 times more power than D because it certainly doesn't, right? And in the second example, right, D has 22% of the votes, but it actually has no influence at all, right? It, its vote does not matter in the least bit, okay? So the question is, you know, in this case, you know, a number like one, right, uh, doesn't, doesn't say, mean that the, uh, the power is, is, is low, and a number like 22 does not mean that a power is big, right? So the question is, you know, is there a way of quantifying um, the, the idea of voting, right? And there's a, a, a notion called power indices that allows you to do this. Professor Volich, I am already at my 20 second, 20 minute mark. Should I just go on for a little bit longer? Yeah, maybe just take a take a few more minutes. Sure, right? I mean. That some some of the people in the in the crowd have been here for three hours, so they're, <laughs> they're here for to the bitter end. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So let, let's give some definitions. All right. And let me say that whenever a mathematician makes a definition, all right, trying to capture a certain social science property, it may not be the only one. It may not be the optimal one. Okay. So there are thousands of versions of what I'm about to tell you. So let's consider the case right here where D has 22 votes, but D actually has no power at all. Okay. So let, let's get some vocabulary. So what we're gonna say is that, you know, A, B, C, and D, okay? These are individual voters with various weights, okay? And they're gonna form coalitions, okay? So if they can form a coalition that wins, it's called a winning coalition. So for example, A, B is a winning coalition because together they have 52 votes and you only need 51. Okay, so ABD is a winning co coalition. I mean, ABD, you know, has 74 votes. Okay, so it certainly wins. But C comma D, C and D is a losing coalition because together with C and D, you only have 48, right? You can't meet the threshold of 51, right? So every coalition is either winning or it's losing, okay? So a coalition is any subset of these four voters, okay? And it's called a winning coalition if you win, and it's called a losing coalition if you lose. Okay, so um, let's just go back. So again, um, let, let's take another example. Okay, so this is four, 10, eight, five, two. Okay, so it looks like A, you know, um, has a little bit more power than B, right? D has very little power. So l let's see what goes on here. A, B, D, if you had put A, B, and D together, okay, uh, you get 20 votes, okay? So that's certainly winning because you exceed 14. Uh, the coalition C, D is losing, right? Because together they only have seven votes, right? And so you only, it doesn't meet 14, okay? So if you're in a winning coalition, right? We say that you are critical if removing you makes you a losing coalition, okay? So here's an example. A, B, and D is a winning coalition, right? But what happens if you remove A, okay? If you remove A from this winning coalition, you only get 10, right? 
and that's a losing coalition. So removing A turns you from a winning coalition to a losing coalition, okay? And in, in, if that's the case, we say that A is critical, okay? A is critical. So also if you remove B, right? If you remove B, then you only get 12 votes left, okay? And that doesn't meet 14. So you, you became, by removing B, you, you became a losing co coalition. So B is also critical. Well, is D critical, okay? Well, if you remove D, who only has two votes, then A and B have 18 together, and that still meets the threshold, right? So D is not critical, right? Because by removing D or putting D in, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? A and B are still gonna form enough votes, okay? So for every winning coalition, you can decide whether each member in that coalition is going to be critical or not. So here's an example, right, of what might happen. So um, there are 16 different coalitions. You can have no coalition or everybody can be in the same coalition, okay? And you can ask yourself, you know, what does it take for you to be a critical voter? Okay, so let's look at AB. Let's look at this row, for example. In AB, okay, you have 18 votes, right? But if you remove either A or you remove B, you, you, you're gonna be a losing coalition, okay? So A and B together, 18. If you remove one of them, less than 14. So both of them are critical, A and B are critical, okay? Uh, let's look at A, B, and C, okay, A, B, and C. So this row right here, A, B, and C give you 23, okay? If you remove A, what happens, right? Well, if you remove A, B and C only add up to 13. So B, so removing A gives you a losing coalition, okay? So A is critical, right? However, suppose you uh, knocked out B, right? Um, let's see, what happens if you knock out B? Um, if you knock out B, you get 15, right? You get 15 because you have A and C. So that's, that's, all, that's, that's still a winning coalition. So B is not critical. Whether you keep B in or remove B, you're still going to be a winning coalition, okay? And so this is a chart on who's critical and who's not, right? And notice that there's only one case in which D is critical, and, you know, A is critical in a lot of places. So you count up the number of critical voters, okay? You, you count up the number of, of letters in the last column. So if you count the number of A, B, C, Ds together, there are 14, okay? Right? There are 14. No, I'm sorry, there are 12. <laughs> there are 12. And then you count the number of times that each uh, letter appears in that list of 12. So A appears five, B appears three times, C appears three times, and D appears one time. And then you take a quotient. Okay. So if you take a look at this, right, if you take a look at the power index of A, you know, A shows up five times out of the 12. So you can say that it has 42% of the power. That's one way to define power, okay? And then uh, B and C have 25, okay? And D has eight. Now there are some things to think about right here. And that is that, that A only had two more votes than B, right? But it had way more power, it has way more power than B, okay? So the numbers 10 and eight don't necessarily give you the relative power between the two. You have to check using this method. Notice that B actually has more votes than C, right? B has eight and C has five, but yet their power index is the same, okay? They matter the same amount in, in the voting, okay? So it's possible for you to have the same power index even though you have different numbers of votes, okay? And it, you could also have a significant power advantage even if you have one or two points above somebody else, okay? So these results are kind of, um, they're kind of unexpected. They're kind of unexpected. So let's, let's just see what, what goes on here. So the Bontoff power index says, I'm gonna take the total number of, of times that all voters are critical, okay? So it's, it's any time that someone is critical, you count that, okay? And then you count the number of A's, B's, C's, and D's, and you take the quotient and that gives you the power index, okay? 
Uh, I should note that this, this index has been around since the, what, the 60s or something like that. It's, it's not new, okay? And there are many, 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 many different variations on this power index. There's not one way of doing it, okay? Um, okay, so let's just go back to the Senate case, okay? In the Senate case, um, it turns out that there are six critical cases, right? Uh, and um, if, you look at, if you look at these cases right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay? There are nine letters here, okay? Um, and A shows up three times, B shows up three times, and D shows up three times. Uh, D shows up, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Oh, I didn't do the calculation actually, but what happens if you actually do the calculations as we did before, D turns out to have zero power, <laughs> okay? D, D is never necessary, okay. Oh, is that, no, hold on. No, 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 I, I apologize, I, I got confused. Uh, I have two examples here. One example is the Senate one, okay? And everyone has 33%, right? As opposed to this one right here, which D supposedly has more power, but it actually has zero power, okay? So this, this sort of method accurately computes uh, what goes on. Um, I know that I don't have a lot of time, so let me just mention that you can do this on all sorts of different uh, configurations. Um, if you have a configuration of the European Economic Community of 1958, you see that these six countries have various kinds of vote distributions, okay? And it turns out that Luxembourg, even though it has one vote, right, actually has uh, no power at all. So it has a vote, but it, it doesn't matter what its vote is. So it, it's kind of called a dummy voter, okay? Um, let's talk about the Security Council real quick as our final example. So remember that one way of representing it is, is this, okay? Um, and um, um, let's see what happens when we try to analyze it in this way, okay? So a winning coalition has to have all five members of the Security Council in it and, and four other ones, okay? So for example, if I have all five of these guys, and I add DR, St. Vincent, Estonia, and Tunisia, then I have a winning coalition, okay? In fact, the winning coalitions have to have the five permanent members and at least four of the other ones, right? So the co winning coalitions shake down like this, right? So you can have five permanent, four non-permanent, five permanent, five non-permanent, okay? So these are all winning coalitions. In total, there are 848 coalitions, okay? Uh, that are winning, right? And so it turns out, right, that um, if you do the math, right, the power index of each permanent member turns out to be about 16.69%. And the power index of each non-permanent member is about 1.6%. So this suggests that permanent members have about 10 times more power than, than the non-permanent members. Um, there are many different, as I mentioned, there are many different kinds of power indices that you can compute, right? Um, if you have a computational scheme that's rigorous, like this one, at least you know what's going on, you can actually try to prove some theorems about it, okay? Um, and that, that's the job of the mathematicians to figure out that if I have a mechanism like this, right? Is there something that's always true? Is there something that's never true, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, so that's the business of mathematicians in these kinds of voting theory scenarios. Right? So that's the, the end of my talk. Um, this is uh, uh, just a little bit of math and I hope that everybody uh, enjoyed it. Are there, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see the chat, so let's see. Questions, questions. comments. Questions. For those of you who are interested in this stuff while you're, if, while you're gathering your questions, if you have them as, so even though these, no, the notions of indices like Banzaf index and some of the related things are sort of old and, and traditional, they, they're still useful to compute. I'm actually working on a project where I'm trying to, I'm from Bosnia, which has a very complicated political system. I'm trying to compute the power indices of certain political parties in the Bosnian parliament. 
with some caveats, like certain coalitions are not allowed because they hate each other, so they will never enter coalitions. And you can sort of make the problem more interesting by actually importing some some like uh, actual facts about what these parties are like in a particular system, right? So so there's plenty, you know, there's a lot of research done on the European Union with the power structure of the European Union. And, and so there's, there's lots of sort of interesting potential ongoing research. Uh, Stanley, based on this model, do we know which state has the highest power index of the electoral college? It, it turns out to be California, right? So the electoral college, right? The, it turns out that for the electoral college, because there are so many members involved, okay? that the power index is not all that different from the percentage of electoral votes that they have. So um, I think that California has about like 10% of the electoral votes that, like, yeah, I mean, a little, but its power index is around 11, okay? So yeah, Cal so, but a, a lot of the cases, the power index is exactly the same as the percentage of electoral votes it has. <laughs> So the bonds of power index actually suggests that bigger states actually have a little more power in the, contrary to what we heard before, right? That small states have more power in the electoral <laughs> college. Well, this kind of more sophisticated math actually has something a little different to say. So this I mean, is also say that there's no way, there's no right way of quantifying any of this. And the more you study it, the more confused you get. <laughs> any other questions? I mean, I guess the issue is that California, right? I mean, it has some amount of power, but it still has to aggregate with others to, to form a majority, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can still use that power index, right? To try to figure out which coalitions like will be enough to give you, uh, to give you a, a- 270. 270, right, yeah. California, get electoral college, do your power. I'm, I'm sorry? Si Wing, is that you? Sorry. It's okay. Hi, Si Wing. Hi, Si Wing. Do you have a question? I didn't get that. Not Could here. you try again? What are you stop that? There's nothing to stop here. Check if the device is on your home Wi Fi network. How do, you, how do I shut it off? <laughs> I have these things shut off. It's my children who turn them on. Right. Yeah. So any any other questions, comments, snide remarks? <laughs> I think a uh, power index like per person is probably the thing that you'd be looking at in terms of when we're talking about like California voters having less power. It's not California having less power, it's per voter because there's just so many people in the state. Yeah. That's true. That's, That's right. right. You can also ask what what power does each individual voter hold in any given state, right? And that's yeah. 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 All right. Well, that might be it. Thank you for those of you who <laughs> stuck it out to the bitter end. Look at you, Mark. <laughs> uh, and and there's uh, this some of our fellows are still around. <laughs> But thank you for any, if any, any other questions, comments, send them to us and, uh, and yeah. Well, so thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Um, um, I hope that this is, you know, we hope that this, these three hours were a distraction <laughs> from the nail biting event that's, that's going on right now. Um, let us know if you have any comments or suggestions about, you know, outreach possibilities, uh, opportunities to learn. That's what we're here for. And thank you to all our fellows for- Yes, great job fellows. Talks. Awesome, awesome work. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hey, Isma. Feeling. <laughs> Hi. <laughs>